at that time. Yeah, at that time. Yeah, you didn't have a choice. Where's your gavel? Council member. Oh, oh Good Welcome evening. Aboard. Thank you, Council Come Member Charette. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here and those who are tuning in, uh, viewing from home. I call to order, order the closed session of the Mayor and City Council. Uh, Ms. City Clerk, can you take a look at the roll call? Council Member Sanchez. Here. Council Member Ibarra is not present at the moment. Council Member Figueroa. Here. Mayor Pro Tem, Charette. Here. <laughs> Council Member Reynoso. Here. Council Member Kelvin. Present. Council Member Alexander. Here. <laughs> and Mayor Tran. Here. Madam City Clerk, do we have any public comments? No, we do not. We would now convene into closed session. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here, and those who are tuning in remotely or from home. I call to order this joint regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council and the Mayor and City Council acting as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency of the City of San Bernardino. Pastor Robert uh, D. Young of P SB Pastors United will lead tonight's invocation. And um, my daughter, Holly Tran, she, she's freaking out, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance afterwards. Good evening, Your Honor, Your Honorable Mayor and City Council. I'm Pastor Reginald Young. I have asked my colleagues with San Bernardino Pastor Janani to come up and join me as I pray and conduct the invocation. I'm representing Loveland Church for the pastor of Charles Singleton. The pastors will join me as I pray. They're going to stand in agreement with me and they're going to pray silently for the city of San Bernardino. Is that all right? Allow us to have a moment of silence first for the recent fallen first responders and the victims of COVID-19 in our city and the county in our nation. Now let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we again come to you today, January 18, 2023, in the year of our Lord, to first thank you for communing with us today. We honor you and acknowledge that you are complete control of our lives and the decisions we make. Second, we thank you for our newly elected Mayor Helen Tran, as you have kept her safe and protected, as she trusts you to govern your people. We thank you for our city council members. They are, are determined to improve the lives of the residents of San Bernardino. They are wise council. Also, there's a special prayer and a blessing over Charles McNeely as he returns to the office temporarily as the city manager. We're also praying for our chief of police, Darren Goodman. We pray that you watch over each one of them, their families, lead them, guide them into all truths. Cover every man and woman, boy and child under the sound of my voice as we continue to believe in the dream. God, we advocate your presence into these proceedings. We pray that all things are done most decent and in order. We pray that you oversee and superintend this meeting and we thank you in advance that all things are being done fair and honest in an effort to ensure public safety and the best results for your people. Lord, get into the agenda tonight. Cause all things to work out to the good. And finally, Lord, be with each speaker, be with each presenter on tonight. Allow us to agree to disagree, but yet remain united in our cause and our efforts to get it right 
during this meeting and future meetings to come. We thank you in advance, and we will sure give glory to and honor and praise to our Father. It is in your Son's name we pray, Jesus. All that agreed, they said, Amen and Amen. Put your right hand over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Young, and thank you, Holly. All right. Uh, Madam City Clerk, please uh, take the roll. Councilmember Sanchez. Here. Councilmember Ibarra. Here. Councilmember Figueroa. Here. Mayor Pro Tem. Here. Councilmember Reynoso. Here. Councilmember Calvin. Present. Councilmember Alexander. Here. And Mayor Chan. Here. Uh, City Attorney, is there anything to report from closed session? No, we had uh, discussions on two matters of pending litigation as noted in the agenda, but there is no reportable action. Thank you. Madam City uh, Manager, please proceed with the City Manager report. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, City Council members, Honorable Mayor. Uh, I will be presenting the Office of the City Manager report this evening. Next slide. The city is uh, recovering from the recent series of winter storms, and we do have our Public Works Department activated and in. Um, at 2 a.m. trying to address all the potholes throughout the city. The priority orders are the arterial streets, secondary streets, and neighborhood streets, and parks and parking lots. To report any potholes in the community, please um, call the number listed on the slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we celebrated MLK. Uh, we had the annual uh, parade and uh, festivities. Our um, grand marshals were our mayor, Tran, and Chief Goodman. Also present were assembly members Jane Reynoso and Supervisor Joe Baca. Next slide. In um, city news, uh, we have a budget and brief available now on the city's website, both in English and Spanish. Additionally, we are seeking volunteers for our homeless point and count, and um, that is uh, scheduled for Thursday, January 26 at 5.30 a.m., bright and early. Um, the point and count is uh, conducted across the nation to determine funding allotments for housing programs um, and services in our local communities. Next slide. Councilmember Alexander, uh, he was appointed to a regional SCAG committee. Um, yes, congratulations on the appointment is to the Energy and Environmental Committee. Um, another bit of good news, online appointments are not available for passport processing with our city clerk's office. Next slide. And um, that uh, concludes our update this evening. Back to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. If you require Spanish interpretation, we do have interpreter on site. Please raise your hand at this time to indicate you will need translation assistance. In addition, we have inter interpreting listening devices available in the back. Please note that the interpreter will be dismissed if we do not receive any requests for interpretation or if the devices are not checked out. Si necesita interpretación en español, tenemos un intérprete presente. Por favor, levante la mano en este momento para indicar que requiere servicios. También tenemos aparatos disponibles para escuchar la junta en español. Si no recibimos solicitud para servicios de, lo, de interpretación o si los aparatos no son utilizados antes de las nueve, el intérprete se retirará. Gracias. Thank you. Council Member Sanchez, do you have any updates to provide? I do. Uh, first is uh, there's been a significant increase 
in 2022 of building permits as well as uh, valuations. Um, so the Community and Economic Development Department issued a total of 6,093 building permits in 2022, exceeding 2021's total by uh, nearly 2,000, an increase of 42%. The total valuation of the 2022 permits issued uh, is nearly $400 million, uh, which is a massive increase, uh, and it will provide for additional services for our community, for the residents who are here. The city will continue to grow, and it's a good indication of the city's health. So let's not, uh, let's not just pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we've done our job. There's more to come, and uh, we won't give up until, uh, until the city is the shining, the shining hill on, the, si the, si the, the shining city on the hill. Um, also in, in, some, in some not so great news, or well, it's, it's a cause for celebration as well, but our very own Janet Aguayo uh, is retiring after 39 years of service to our city. Uh, she, uh, she served uh, in our PD for 35 years, um, and she has provided uh, security for us over the last couple of years at these council meetings. Uh, she always greets everyone with a smile. She makes people feel safe. Uh, and just like some, a couple other employees we have here who've been here uh, for a long time, she seems to be everywhere. I see her at City Hall. I see her in the parking structure, making sure everything's right. She's here. I'm across town and she's there. Uh, so she puts in the hard work, and I, I, knowing her, she's put in that hard work every day that she's come to this city for the last 39 years. So I applaud you. I'm sad to see you go, but congratulations on your well-deserved retirement. That's it. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Council Member Ibarra, do you have any updates to provide? Yes, uh, during our winter break, uh, I showed um, our newly elected mayor the second ward where she saw the need um, for our city to get back on track, um, especially with all the homeless encampments coming up around our city. I've mentioned it before, but there are other agencies dropping off homeless into our city. Uh, this past weekend on Martin Luther King Day, I did notice a young man with a blue um, county jail hospital outfit limping on Fifth Street by himself. Um, he had just been released in, in our streets. I'm, I'm hoping that whoever he was, that he made it home and safe because he was not in the medical condition to be walking by himself the way he was. Um, another thing that I have done is I followed up on all the... Uh, capital improvement projects that I had requested about two, uh, two years ago with the support of council. Um, several streets that have been neglected for several decades were finally all paved. Um, the streets were Acacia, Virginia. Virginia is north of Baseline, Acacia south of Baseline, um, Valencia, Fremontia, Niles, Trenton. Uh, and then we had Hillside, Fairfax, Cross, and Conejo Drive all fixed this year as promised by our city. So um, just know that we are working to help uh, fix our city little by little. It's been decades of neglect and we are working hard to um, get our city back to normal, normal, some normalcy, hopefully back to the, the year to when we were the all-American city. On January 11th, Paris Hill Neighborhood Association and Valencia Neighborhood Association had their meeting at the Dennis, uh, Denny's on the corner of Highland and Valencia. Um, I went there, um, we had a, a, a quick meeting here at the council. I, I made the trip and I provided just quick updates to our community members just so they know all those affected in that area of the improvement, improvements going on and any updates from the city. 
Thank you, Ms. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Figueroa, do you have any updates to provide? Uh, the, yeah, thank you, Mayor. You know, and in fact, I was, I'd left my notes. Um, I didn't bring them with me, but it doesn't matter because the, the events that I was going to announce aren't really in until February anyway, so I could just announce them at the next uh, council meeting. But happy new year to everybody and welcome to your first official um, full meeting, regular meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Charette, do you have any updates to provide? Well, very good. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. And again, uh, I'll, I'll second that. Congratulations on your first really full-time, full official meeting. Um, looking forward to working with you, and I think you're going to do a great job for our city. So, um, and you're calling it an update. This isn't necessarily an update. We have their announcements, and I don't really have any real announcements tonight. Uh, a couple that are pretty important. Um, they're all important, but this one is, uh, I want to make sure everyone's aware of this. Um, on the um, 28th of this month, that's on a Saturday morning, the 28th, up at Wildwood Park, uh, there's going to be a, a flagpole uh, dedication ceremony uh, dedicating uh, a flagpole in Tony Marzulu's name. Uh, he was very, very active with the Wildwood group, very active in the community. Uh, you didn't want to cross him. Uh, he got in fights at Stater Brothers up on 40th Street when people were acting up. And I told him, please, you know, Tony, <laughs> calm it down a little bit. You're going to get in trouble. But great guy. His brother served the city as EDA director for many years. And, and the Marzulu family is a great uh, asset to our community. But Tony really stood out. And so anyone that's uh, uh, able to attend that, it's at 536 East 40th Street, that's uh, the corner of, of uh, Waterman and 40th Street, north, uh, the, the big park. Everyone's familiar with Wildwood Park. So uh, come out and join us as we uh, honor, honor Tony for his dedication to this, uh, that neighborhood and to this city. And then I'm going to um, also uh, do my normal thing and announce again uh, and remind everybody that fentanyl is a critical issue in our country. And um, we need to just make sure that people understand, do not take any drugs off the street. I mean, what I mean is don't, let's take them off the street. <laughs> let's take them off the street, but don't consume them. <laughs> don't consume them off the street. Uh, get them from a pharmacy or from a doctor. Do not uh, take anything because you just can't trust it anymore. You just can't. And then I've got one really selfish, um, proud moment that I want to share. Um, my oldest daughter, Jennifer, uh, unfortunately doesn't live here because she'd be a great uh, asset to this community. Uh, she has a master's and three quarters of a degree, but was asked by the University of Nevada to uh, participate in a PhD program, um, asked to apply she applied, she was accepted, and is going to be uh, paid not only, a, not only for the full ride PhD program, but a stipend through the whole five-year period. So uh, very, very proud of her. She's done that all on her own. And um, just can't tell you how much, how proud I am and the hard work that she's done, and she really deserves it. Was, she was nervous that she was going to get accepted, but they invited her. Why would they not accept her? So um, she was accepted, and she starts, I th think, Monday, actually. So uh, real proud, and, a, and a, I want to tell everyone how much I love her and her sister. Um, <laughs> and, um, and wish her the very best. It's going to be a five-year program, and, and I, again, I, I'm sorry to take up the time, but I'm awfully proud of her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Reynoso, do you have any updates or announcements? Thank you, Mayor Tran, and good to have you right here. Um, first off, obviously the potholes. Um, the city manager, thank you for the update. A lot of people have been obviously raising the concerns. The fifth ward, we are sloped more than any other ward, and so we are flooded, and the potholes are exposed, you know, intermittently, unfortunately. Sometimes you don't even know they're there. Um, but we're repairing those. Also, something I'm very proud of, um, it'll get done. It might not be done in my tenure, but it hasn't been touched in decades, is the Myers Creek storm drain system. The study is finally on the agenda. We're going to get that done. Thank you, um, Director Hernandez, for following through with that. 
Um, also, the Blair Park Neighborhood Association, I, myself, uh, and Mayor Tran, as well as Lieutenant Castro, will be there this Saturday, 10 a.m. at Blair Park, at the, um, not Blair Park, I'm sorry, at the Shannon Hills Golf Course. So please attend if you can. And the last thing I wanted to mention is I currently, we're, we're contemplating some um, appointments tonight, but I've had the opportunity to be on the Inland Valley Development Agency, which I'll be very frank, I think is a front for a development company, and it has been since Norton Air Force Base closed. And there is currently an overlay known as the Airport Gateway Specific Plan that is slated to overlay um, and connect a lot of the business corridor and make it industrial straight up. Before I got into this seat, I was informed by those residents at their doors that they didn't want any more warehouses. And I don't think it's any secret that people in the majority of this community don't want any more warehouses. Unfortunately, even the people who supported me in labor unions who build these warehouses have spoken very frankly to me and said, my kids won't work in those warehouses, but we need jobs. We understand that, but we have to provide some new business opportunities. With that being said, there was a, a workshop, if you'll call it that. It was chaotic, and I have some words with uh, the airport director that I'll be sharing with him personally, but expect another formal meeting where there will be public input verbally spoken because it was not done properly, and unfortunately, I was the only elected official in all the city at this event. And I don't expect everybody to know about it, but I expect everybody to care about the Third Street Corridor because although we have a bajillion warehouses, that does not mean we have to build more. And so we're just completely inundated and career opportunities don't exist beyond industrial. I'm not saying they're all bad employers inside, but we know the deal, I don't need to explain it to you. And so I want people to pay attention to what's happening at the airport. If nothing else, they sent out mail in a certain radius from the airport. But moving forward, expect to hear updates from me about the airport because people need to know that we're not just flying to Vegas and San Francisco, which is beautiful, but we're also contemplating displacing through eminent domain a lot of residents who live down there on the south side. And who's going to speak for them? I work city first, ward second, and that's it. And so thank you. That's all. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member... <clears throat> Council Member Calvin, do you have any updates or announcements? I most definitely do. Welcome everybody this evening and I'm so happy to see you and happy new year to you all. Thank you for coming out. We know it's chilly outside, but you know what? This was what matters, that we continue to come down to the city, that you can vo verbalize your voices to us, your, your thoughts and what it is that you wanna see and we have an opportunity to tell you what it is that we're doing in the community as well. So thank you for your um, support and I appreciate you guys coming down. I wanna also say thank you to to um, San Bernardino Black Chamber of Commerce. They put on two phenomenal events this past week in the honor of Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They put on a beautiful gala and they did the Martin Luther King Parade that marched down baseline uh, in the Sixth Ward. And I wanna say thank you to Congressman Pete Aguilar, uh, Assembly Members Eloise Gomez Reyes and James Ramos, um, Senator um, Rosalisi Ro Ochoa Bo, um, Councilman Damon Alexander came, of course, Mayor Tran was there, uh, Dr. Gwendolyn Rogers from County Schools, uh, Dr. Scott Wyatt from City Schools, Myra Sabalas and Mary Ellen from the City School District as well. So we had a lot of community support that came out and that was very, very important. I think that I wish that more of my colleagues had come down because I think that it's important to show a united front and that we support activities throughout the entire city, so I really do appreciate everyone that came out. I want to say thank you to the Northwest PAC for having their uh, meet and greet, bringing the mayor to um, meet some of the constituents in Ward 6 and Ward 1. And Mayor, we just want to say thank you, and we appreciate you, and we know that you're going to do a, a wonderful job. I want to say thank you and, uh, to, and a warm welcome to former council member of Ward 6, Mr. Dan Frazier, is in the building tonight. I think, Mr. Frazier, were you the third councilman for the ward or the fourth? Third councilman, thank you so much. And I wanna also say welcome to our former city manager and now newly interim city manager, Mr. Charles McNeely. Please stand, sir. <laughs> So 
So there are so many things, and so many uh, people have done wonderful events through the holidays. I can't uh, say thank you enough. So many organizations that have been doing wonderful things, and they couldn't do it without city help. So our staff here have been um, wonderful in helping a lot of these, all of these projects that you guys hear about going forward. We can't do it without their support. So thank you, city staff. We appreciate you. That's all of my announcements. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Council Member Alexander, do you have any updates or announcements? Yes. Happy New Year, San Bernardino. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Thank you. Thank you. And Merry Christmas. Because I love Christmas. So to all those who missed out because we didn't have a council meeting during Christmas. So I just want to let you know that I drove around the 7th Ward looking for the best houses during Christmas. I know, but because I love Christmas. And I, and I saw, and I was supposed to do our analysis, but we didn't have any. So there was a house on 20, in my new part of my ward, 20, about 24th and Muscubiabi. It must have had a 20-foot Santa Claus. I mean, no, snowman. It's the largest snowman I've ever seen. And so I told them I was going to give Anthony and his family a shout-out. So, Anthony, if you're watching, this is the shout-out because that was the largest snowman I've seen. And, the be and I was going to give a shout-out to the best street that I drove around because we didn't have a meeting, ladies and gentlemen, and I noticed in my ward, my, the best street that I noticed in my ward during Christmas was Avery Street. Now, the former mayor sitting right there and his daughter lives on Avery Street, and by the way, I live on Avery Street. And out of all the houses on Avery Street, we only had two houses that weren't decorated. So Avery Street residents, you guys are the bomb. <laughs> So, keep moving along. Um, th coming up is uh, Dr. Nag. Uh, neighborhood is, is uh, st Dr. Nag. People always ask me, what does that stand for? It's, it's an acronym. It stands for Del Rosa Neighborhood Association Group. So, it doesn't, it's not a person. Because they're like, God, that's a terrible name. But it, it stands for something. It'll be January 28th, ladies and gentlemen. They're doing their, their cleanup. And you, you just call Dan, and his number is 909-883-4039 if you live in the Dr. Nag area. It's their neighborhood cleanup, and they do a fantastic job. They actually, they, they really do. Also, coming up is Paris Hill and uh, Valencia Neighborhood Association on February 8th. They're going to have their annual meeting at Denny's at 6 p.m. Denny's at 6 p.m. Please, if you live in the Valencia, Paris Hill Park area right around there, please come out and uh, participate. Also, the point in time count was also mentioned, but it's, uh, it, 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 was, it was cold last year. It was like in the 30s, or, or it was cold. Council member, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Ibarra? Yeah, that's right, raise your hand, girlfriend. Uh, we were out there, it, it, it was cold, but we were still out there, we were counting, and uh, please come on out and join us, uh, because that's where the money let me, let, me, let me explain to you. This is not the sexy part, like I always like to say. When we do the count, and they count how many people there are in our city, that's how the money is allocated. Okay? So we need as many people out there to make sure this is accurate as possible in five hours, which you, you, you let's be honest, you can't be really accurate in five hours, but we can do the best we can, right? But please, the more volunteers we have out there, the more people we can count. So I like to ask my pastor says, amen? I, 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 can't, I got a room full of pastors. Amen? Amen. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, on on uh, February 23rd, I'll be mentioning this on to, ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. At Ecclesia Baptist Church, I have a, I'm hosting a 7th Ward development. It's going to be uh, what's going on in the 7th Ward. All the upcoming development, what's in the pipeline of development, uh, how do you, do you do development, how do you buy city land, uh, what are ADUs, all this is going to be hosted at Ecclesia on February 23rd, 6 to 8 p.m. at Ecclesia. Look out the various uh, social media sites will be posted from tonight from now on. Again, that's February 23rd, 6 to 8 p.m. at Ecclesia. All types of development. You guys want to know how to improve our city, how to make our cities better, understanding development. We're going to talk about it on uh, February 23rd. And Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, it's the Mayor's update. <clears throat> Happy New Year, everyone. 
And wow, what a beautiful turnout tonight. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that Lunar New Year, um, the Year of the Rabbit, which begins this Friday, and that's a, a part of my culture, so I just want to make that announcement. And it's a three-day uh, affair, so that's a new year for us. Um, this past Monday, which Councilwoman uh, Calvin did an, um, an announce regarding about the Martin Luther King events this past weekend, and I had the honor to attend uh, the gala and witness my colleagues receive awards. So Councilman Alexander, Councilwoman Kim Calvin, and our chief, um, Darren Goodman, all received awards and at the gala, so it was, it was an honor to be there to witness that. Um, the parade was beautifully put together. Thank you, staff, and uh, the community members for putting that together. That was really beautiful. And uh, that um, it would, did not rain. So we were honored to be and blessed to have the sun uh, warm us in the community together. Uh, the breakfast was beautiful as well, and I was able to, and we had a lot of elected officials who showed up, as well as for the parade. So it was a beautiful, again, gathering. The Parks and Recreation Community Services Commission is meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, for those who um, are interested in the Parks and Recreation area, please do attend. Um, tomorrow as well, 4 to 7, the Inland Empire Regional Chamber will be hosting an open house for Studio D, and I hope to see you there because I will be attending. On the January 21st, which um, our Councilman uh, Ray Nelson mentioned about the Blair Park Neighborhood Association, I will be in attendance with our Councilman, so I hope to see you there as well as uh, taking place on January 21st at the Young Visionaries Youth Leadership Resource Center is the first annual for iconic Dr. Margaret B. Hill All About the Children Day, presented by the Young Visionaries Youth Leadership Academy and Maggie's Kids Foundation. It is a family-friendly event. There will be activities, carnival-style games, kid zones, arts and crafts, special concert honoring Dr. Margaret Hill, and scholarship presentation. I hope to see you there. I will be attending. Um, and uh, thank you, Councilman uh, Alexander, for mentioning the point in time count. It's a very, very, very critical um, count that we do need volunteers. Um, I will be there along with the council member. I believe other council members will be there. Hope you can come out and help us to uh, uh, assist with the count. It's 5.30, 10.30, and we meet at the San Manuel Stadium. Again, uh, that is a very, very critical process for us to ensure funding is available to us. In the last count, we had about 13 hundred members who are unhoused from last year's count. I would imagine um, that number is going to be increased significantly. And just recently, I had put out a press release um, that we will be uh, presenting to the council for a declaration for state emergency because we need to recognize that there is a crisis and we'll do everything uh, possible to make that a priority to address. And uh, let's see. Um, thank you, Councilman uh, Charette, for mentioning about our uh, lifelong resident, Tar Tony Marzullo, who is the former president of the Wildwood Parkers Neighborhood Association, for that memorial. Now, moving to our presentations. Presentation by Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Orange County and the Inland Empire celebrating National Mentoring Month. We do have a, a presenter. Is that correct, Madam City Clerk? Jennifer, Jennifer, hi, good evening. Good evening. I'm going to turn this over to you. Excellent. Well, hopefully I'm the first to, to wish you a happy National Mentoring Month. Um, January is a beautiful time that we get to celebrate um, the gift of our community giving back, giving back as mentors, um, giving voice to our young people and allowing us to share. So um, honorable mayor, city council members, thank you for having me. My name is Jennifer O'Farrell. I'm the chief external affairs officer at your big brothers, big sisters. Next slide. And so we, we talk about mentorship a lot, we hear about mentorship a lot, but let me reintroduce to you what it means to Big Brothers Big Sisters. So what it means to us is that we are Jedis. No, are we Luke Skywalker? But we are about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's the framework and the foundation in which we operate on, what we've operated on for the last 120 years, and as we are eight years young, what we have we been operating here? We are youth-centered, we are volunteer-driven, and we are one-to-one. -one. Next slide. So we aspire to create more caring and connected communities. That's truly the fabric of what mentoring gives. Um, so when you think about Big Brothers Big Sisters, the return on investment we're bringing back to the city of San Bernardino is we're focusing on social capital and connection. We're focusing on emotional and mental health and well-being of our young people, education and career success, and positive choices. 
And so we talk about ROI when we talk about the return on investment, what are we doing? So this is our regional numbers when we're talking about 3,000 youth. What does that look like for the city of San Bernardino? That looks like 800 youth on an annual basis. And again, I said, we are matching them one to one. So every young person has their own mentor, their own champion to call, to reach upon, to inspire them, to move them forward. Um, that drives back roughly um, about $2.2 million back to the city on an annual basis based on volunteer hours and time. So what are some specific projects? We have some really great things that we are investing and innovating in in the city of San Bernardino. Um, the first is um, what we've launched this year is our Workforce Development Mentorship Program. This is tied with San Manuel and San Bernardino Valley College. And we're working on looking at creating job opportunities, career opportunities through a mentorship um, a roadmap where San Manuel employees are mentoring Valley College students and really giving them the tools, the skills, and the training to support them and have them hopefully have a job at the end and an internship at the end um, of, their, of their journey with them. We've also launched in the midst of a pandemic our first generation mentorship program. This is really tied to our uh, to San Bernardino City Unified, looking at high school students, supporting our high school students in most need and having them mentored by a Cal State um, University of San Bernardino student. So really looking at first generation to have a diploma in their home and first generation to go to college and creating that pipeline and transition from high school to college. And one of our favorites is we're bringing back is our school-based mentoring program. Next slide. Um, so this is really a win-win. And bringing back, meaning we weren't able to deploy in, in the midst of the pandemic, but we are bringing back by high demand by the district um, where high school students come on to campuses. Oh, thank um, on, on a weekly basis. So these are high school students that are serving as mentors. We have high school students from Cajon, Pacific, San Bernardino High that are mentoring Riley, Anton, and Newark elementary school students. Um, really creating a win-win when we talk about developing our future leaders, our future, hopefully, city council members and mayors, and really uplifting our elementary school students that need an additional champion and support. Um, so as my dad said to me eight years ago when I started at Big Brothers Big Sisters, he's like, "Hannah, mentoring's nice, but what does it really do? Um, and so I'm here to say that we have proven outcomes, proven outcomes specifically happening in San Bernardino City. Um, so one of them is when we talk about depression and anxiety is that 87% of our youth reported um, improved. They're doing better because they have someone alongside. They've had someone to call, someone to be with them. 98% um, of our youth graduated on time this year with 43% of them the first in their family to have a high school diploma. So what we are doing is work is working and what we want to do is more of that within the city. Um, and 67% were the first in their family to attend college. So creating that next generation, when we talk about eliminating generational poverty, we need to think about mentorship as a key tipping point for our young people's success. And last but not least, in honor of National Mentoring Month, I would be remiss if I didn't invite all of you to be big brothers or big sisters with us. Um, and to invite those online watching, to invite our residents here to, to not, not consider being a champion for a young person. I think back to what if every third grader in our entire city had a mentor? What if we could really come alongside and eliminate the pipelines and barriers that our young people face because our community that cares gives back and mentors. So I encourage everybody to consider being a mentor. If you've had a mentor, thank them this month. Thank them for championing you and encouraging you. Um, but join the mentoring movement and join the village with us. Thank you for being supporters and partners in mentoring. Thank you for being champions of our young people in our city. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Farrell. Thanks so much. Yeah. Next, we have the um, Citizen of the Month, Wade Ford, lead pastor, San Bernardino 16th Street, Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church. So tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing to you my Citizen of the Month, our Citizen of the Month, for the City of San Bernardino, and this recognition states, Certificate of Recognition from the Mayor and City Council 
honoring Wade Ford, lead pastor of San Bernardino 16th Street, Seventh-day Adventist Church, January 2023. Citizen of the Month Award, C is for concern, I is for investor, time, T is for time and talent, I is for involved, Z is for zealous, E is for enthusiastic, N is for neighborly. In recognition of dedicated service to the affairs of community and for the civic pride demonstrated by numerous deeds for the benefit of the citizens of San Bernardino, presented this 18th day of January 2023 to Mr. Wade Ford. I'd like to just say a couple of things about Pastor Ford. Pastor Ford um, is all of these things that we have I've already described as the word citizen, but he cares so much. He's recently come back uh, to 16th Street, Seventh day Adventist Church, and Pastor Ford goes above and beyond the call of duty. Whenever I call him, he's there. He's always calling me and asking me, what do you need, council member? And sometimes I don't even know how to answer that because I don't always get that question. But I appreciate Pastor Ford and for all that he does for the youth uh, at his church and for his seniors. He truly has a heart for his seniors. So we honor you today, Pastor Ford. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. Thank you to my Councilwoman, Kimberly Calvin. It's an honor to be back in the city of San Bernardino. 20 years ago, I was the youth pastor at the church that I grew up at and gone, pastored quite a few churches in different places. So it was an honor when the church leaned out and asked me to come back as the lead pastor on the west side of San Bernardino, where it's an honor to be a part be able to make some level of contribution, believe that impact happens more than just what happens on the weekend. My belief indeed is that the goal of the church should be able to make this city a better place in every aspect, that when people wake up on Monday morning, that they would be excited because they've been inspired, they've been encouraged, they've been, in, they've been empowered, and they've been resourced. But I'd be wrong if I didn't acknowledge the work of my wife, who not just came alongside, but on many efforts of last year, she led the charge for the different activities that we had. We even brought camels and zebras to the west side of San Bernardino. <laughs> And that indeed was the efforts of a creative idea that how about exposure as an effort to open the minds and the hearts of all those in our city to believe that there's more than the four blocks of which many of them have been raised, that more and greater is actually a possibility. So our goal indeed at 16th Street, 7th Avenue Church is not just to expose, but to empower and to resource so that the greater days would be the days to come and what these young people and the lives of our middle age and seniors, but see more, be more, and hope for more. God bless you all, and thank you so much in honor. God bless you. Okay, moving on to public comments. We have about 21 public comments, and uh, it is three minutes each. So I'll start with Dr. Janetta Million, followed by Don Rabon. Just press the button. Good evening. Congratulations to our newly elected mayor and all the new officers of our San Bernardino city. Uh, we are a Servants Heart Community Development International. And my name is, again, Dr. Janetta Million, the CEO, founder of that organization. Uh, serving here in the city of San Bernardino continually for the last 21 years. We are asking from our city officials assistance in retrieving suitable facility space, two to 3,000 square feet, with office and warehouse space. Um, 
much needed for our donated items to distribute to our clients. We are here to help bring our city up, step up, but we need your help as we help you with our city and together we can do this. At this t very time, our city needs all the resources and help they can get. And we have very good programs, but we need a facility to continue to do that. So we're asking for assistance. I will be contacting and calling and uh, speaking to each one of your offices to see what type of help you can give us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Don Mabone, and um, me and my girls that we grew up with here in San Bernardino, we're here because we're a little concerned. And I'm glad this is the first time we've ever participated in your council meeting. And I want to welcome you, Mayor, to um, this commitment. Um, but hopefully you guys can do something about the homelessness because it's really heavy on our hearts. Um, it's getting really out of hand. And um, hopefully you guys will make a difference in the community this time around because it's been bad for a long time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Edward uh, Wilbert, followed by Dolores Armstead. Frank Montes, and then Monica Smith. I'm just gonna go four at a time. I am Edward Wilbert, former planning commissioner and resident of the Seventh Ward. Our commissioner were, uh, the commissioner of the Seventh Ward. <coughs> our, um, well, all right. Uh, about a year ago, the house next door was uh, sold to a couple of owned approximately uh, 32 short-term rentals, which are advertised as uh, rented through Airbnb and on website. To the best of my knowledge, renting Airbnbs is their only business. Other than holding <coughs> seminars and workshops to teach people how to become multimillionaires through Airbnb. The owner has, uh, has in fact, held three overnight workshops in this house that last, uh, that last throughout the weekend and has generated over 25 cars parked in the driveway in our streets. When we first bought this issue up to the city, we were told that we had nothing to worry about, that nobody would <coughs> want to come to San Bernardino. <coughs> we thought the same thing, but could not have been more wrong since the house is rented almost nonstop since March. Although the house is listed as an Airbnb, it has no, par it has no parties allowed, which is a fact uh, set up specifically for the purpose of parties. We never, <coughs> we together with many of our neighbors, have been deluged with endless party noise from every morning through the night and day, mostly coming from the outside pool area. The house been, uh, can sleep 10 to 15 people and is often shared by multiple families. We have been awakened by uh, fights in the, in amongst the renters at 4 a.m. and inebriated partygoers playing loud music that goes on until 2 in the morning. Renters knocking on our door asking for to enter our backyard to pick up our fruit and renters wanting to retrieve their pool toys. Uh, we live in a residence that is zoned uh, family neighborhood. We believe that owners of the Airbnb are not paying transcend occupancy tax or business taxes. We can, uh, how can this business be permitted to run in the middle of a residential zone neighborhood? The owners of the, na of the particular house have never lived there. <coughs> uh, this is a full-time business and was bought and redeveloped solely for the purpose of turning into an Airbnb. Many people who live in the mountains live in their homes only to a short term rentals and apartments in the neighborhood uh, mountain neighborhoods and are not unusual. However, uh, that is not the case. Uh, our neighborhood, which consists only of full time family residents, short term rentals <clears throat> are becoming more and more popular in response to other cities. Uh, and are developing strict restrictions uh, because of the noise destruction of the neighborhoods, trash, and if... Thank you very much. Thank you. Dolores Armstead, followed by uh, Frank Montez, followed by Monica Smith. Okay. <clears throat> 
Happy New Year, everyone. We're starting off this year on a good foot. Thank you, God, for a new mayor. Welcome, Mayor Tran. And a capable and experienced city manager, Mr. McNeely, thank you. We look forward to working with you to take the city up, and we're watching. Again, we're hoping that the city manager and council consider providing a dedicated staff to our council people. I see it's on item 35. I hope that's part of it, because we need it. You guys need it, okay? Uh, also, can we get an update on downtown redevelopment? It's been a while. Where does it stand? Because we're all uh, excited. We're excited about the city manager. Now, let's, how do we go forward? Uh, items 22 through 26 are all increases to the police department. They're all, most of them are grants, totaling uh, more than 1.6 million. Can we get a report, all that money coming in, can we get a report on what's happening, especially the tobacco grant? What are, how is the city benefiting from all this money? How are we benefiting when it goes to the P PD? What's coming to us? Uh, item 29 and 30 do not indicate property zoning and what is proposed to be built there. That information is provided on all the other ordinances, so we know what's proposed. Why not on this time? What's up? Uh, item, let's see, we want to bring back the RFP for the demolition of Carousel Mall. We need to take care of that. It's past due. We need to take the city up. And also, can we agendize the abatement of Oxbow? It is time. We have new leadership. Let's do something. And then uh, item 32. If you just clarify it for us citizens, what does that mean? A lease agreement regarding, uh, regarding public right of way. Just explain it to us, because it wasn't very clear. And I think we all deserve that. Other than that, Happy New Year. We're watching you. Let's see the city go up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Frank Montes, called by Monica Smith. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, members of the community. My name is Frank Montes. I'm a small business advocate uh, here in the state of California with offices here in the city of San Bernardino, Ontario and Riverside, and soon to be in the city of Pomona. Um, I, I just want to say that it's been great seeing the energy in the city. It's been a while since I've seen the folks come together and participate in events and celebrate what's happening in the city. Last week was amazing. Uh, spent some time with uh, the uh, Councilman Alexander uh, Calvin and, of course, our mayor. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, what uh, one of the council members said, it would have been great to see more of the city council there uh, because it, we need to work together. Uh, the council needs to work together with the mayor because without all of you working together, nothing's gonna get done. The city has an opportunity to move forward pretty quick, pretty quick with the work of all of you together. I, I do wanna say, Madam Mayor, that you're probably gonna uh, spend your first term cleaning up the mess from the last term. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we, we know that, so I, a message to the council members and the community, uh, give her some slack on that uh, because it's gonna happen. She can't get her job done till she cleans up the mess from the past. And uh, I, I do think it's, a, I believe it's a, an amazing idea to give each council member a dedicated staff because there's so much work to be done. But also, Mayor, where's your staff? Uh, we, need, we need to know where, who your uh, uh, um, uh, reps are because there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of, there's a lot of opportunities here in the city, not just the city of San Bernardino, but regionally. I do want to uh, ask our council members to, and most of you do, to remember San Bernardino is not an island, that we need to work with our neighbors. We need to make sure that that what uh, affects, remember what affects San Bernardino affects Rialto and, and um, uh, back and forth. You know, what, what affects them, of course, uh, affects us. And I do wanna say that uh, our offices are on D Street. Uh, we will be re, uh, 
redoing our lease to, for another three years. We will be inviting everyone here to our uh, grand opening. We're mo moving to larger offices because we will have two staffers here in the city of San Bernardino to assist uh, the residents and the small businesses of San Bernardino so we don't have to depend on these warehouse jobs. And another thing I want to remind everyone that the homeless issue is everywhere. It's not just in San Bernardino. And I strongly believe we do not have a homeless issue. We have a mental health issue. So we need mental health assistance for our homeless community. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Smith, followed by Dr. Treasurer Ortiz and Aurora McElroy. Good evening, can you hear me good? I wanna make sure this goes out real loud and good. How you doing, San Bernardino and the surrounding counties? Happy New Year and uh, the people of God. I wanna say that if you're not informed, we are our brother's keeper. Um, so glad to hear we seem to be addressing the homeless issue here. I'm more concerned about here. I grew up here, and it is. It's heartbreaking. I'm angry, yes, because I know that it shouldn't be like this. At the same time, people say they're not angry. Yes, I am. I don't mind saying I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm hurt um, because I got a lot of family, friends, family, and it's, the environment is terrible. And you look at the young people, you know, people say environment is nothing. I know it's everything. Oh, you got a choice. They overuse that choice thing. However, I'm really grateful that we're all here because I believe God is looking and he got expectations. It's not just a meeting. We're here by divine appointment. So I believe that we all need to really take a second longer look at what's really going on and the times that we're faced with. Not to get, they say religion. I'm not about religion. It's about relationship with your maker, your creator. And he created us to care for others, not just for ourselves. So when we do see somebody out there, and he said, I'm going to piggyback on this gentleman. Um, it's not a homeless issue. It's a, a mental issue. It's a drug issue, too. They got drugs all in the city, OK? And I've talked to different officials, whatever, they say, well, they can't do this and that. I don't believe that. They, they see everything that goes on, so they need to get some more force with it, even if it's prayer, and take serious what's going on. People's lives are being really, I mean, just affected in a negative way. And people act like they're not going to be accountable. I want to let you know that everybody here that's of any age, is gonna be accountable if you haven't been told that. So I take it serious because I've seen a lot of death and that's something that's, that's final. So it's nothing to play with the homeless issue, the drug issue, the mental health issue, all the monies that are going out. You know, I can't tell people how to spend their money, but I do know that there's enough money to make more effort toward the things that's happening in the city. And it's an eyesore. It really is. It's an eyesore. You ride by and see all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it looks terrible. I mean, you know, I don't even want, I don't even want my grandkids to even see anything like this, okay? Because this looks terrible. And they're, they're in surrounding cities, okay? And it doesn't, it doesn't look hopeful for a lot of, you know, <laughs> just to say a few, you know? So let's get busy, y'all. You know, this is 2023. I'm not young, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I, I expect to see something Thank major you. before the year is out. Miss Lady, a uh, mayor, you know what I'm saying, that got the power. But we know who got all power. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you, Miss Smith. <laughs> Dr. Treasurer Ortiz, followed by Aurora McElroy, Jose Gomez. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Welcome, Madam Mayor. So the agenda has some really great things in the consent calendar. A lot of good money is coming into the city in the way of grants. And it's really exciting. And I hope some of you guys are able to pull that and talk to the community about it. I'm really happy to see our new chief of police taking the action to really address violence 
it, it is so reassuring to see the social media posts, to see what's happening and what's being done. Because that's how we're really going to start affecting the change in the community. There is one issue, though, that I think is problematic. Because I want to talk about homelessness. Because there's this narrative in the belief that homelessness exists in this city because people just get dropped off here. But we know that the data shows that over 40% of the homeless identify this city as their home city. We have created our own homeless here, and we continue to do that. We just saw 140 families displaced from 344th Street. And what bothers me is looking in this consent calendar, tonight you will approve a half a million dollars strictly for legal fees for the court case that had Sandra Ibarra in it. We are expending half a million dollars for our elected officials who do wrong outside the scope of their office. So going into this new year, going into how we are going to look at putting in a state of emergency for homeless and open ourselves up to funding, you need to first be responsible for yourselves, for our tax dollars, for what our priorities are. You just did an amazing move by bringing back Mr. McNeely as our city manager. That's awesome utilize him to the utmost extent but if you can't pull yourselves together we're never going to get anywhere and i appreciate you ben for i'm sorry councilman Renos. i super appreciate you for september bringing back the state of emergency for february 1st i ask you also to bring back the oxbow the planning commission has said they do not want grinding and crushing in this city that means we can abate i ask you to bring back the rfp for the downtown demolition what we saw uh, daniel hernandez pull in that presentation of telling us that $7.5 million or almost $8 million is only to get rid of the top half of the mall and nothing underground, that means that you're going to bring another $16 million cost to this city, and you know it. Plus, you can't grind on site because that bidder was able to have information that no one else was allowed to have. Please fix these things going forward. You're doing well in so many areas, but do well in all things because collectively, as Theodore Sanchez says, we want to be that shining city on the hill. Well, you know what? It cannot be built on contaminated soil. It cannot be built on the backs of the poor. It cannot be built on the futures of our children never being anything more than warehouse wickers. This is your job. So good luck. Happy New Year. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Aurora McElroy. Followed by Jose Gomez. Followed by Paula Plunk. Hi, good evening, um, council members, mayor, and fellow San Bernardino citizens. My name is Aurora McElroy. I am a resident of the Fourth Ward under Mr. Shoret's jurisdiction. I am also a proud San Bernardino resident, have gone to college here. My only job, except for a short stint overseas, has been with the San Bernardino City Public Schools. I am a third grade teacher. And I go to work exhausted because of a very, very, very in a unfortunate situation that we have next door. We have something called an Airbnb, which has deprived the residents of my neighborhood uh, just short above North Park Boulevard of the safety, the peace, and the tranquility. The, neighbor, the Airbnb next door has essentially become a flop house, trap house, crack house, whatever you want to call it, party central. It has gotten to the point that San Bernardino PD has had to come out six, seven strong, double teamed. There has been Hemador. Let me see. I can name the bottles of liquor that have been littered up and down the streets. And then I have people sitting that I don't even know straddled on my fence. That is not the neighborhood that I bought that house in. Second, I don't know if anybody else in here really can relate or you live near an Airbnb, but I don't wish that on you for anything. When I attempted to sell my house, first thing they asked was, who are the neighbors? My realtor had to disclose it was an Airbnb. Guess what? I still live in that house. I haven't sold it. Additionally, the loss, the long-term loss of tranquility of living in a beautiful home that I bought with hard sweat and tears. The character of the neighborhood has changed to an extent that it's not what it used to be. 
So moving forward, now that you've heard my complaint, let's hear about why I'm here. I'm asking you to take some serious action and I'm asking for it to be done now. At least have that discussion where there is an open mind towards protecting the livelihood, the property interests, the income, the character, and the peace of mind so that I don't have crack hoes who spread $240 a night, eight to 15 strong in the house doing their business where I can hear it from my second story. So let me ask you, let's do simple math. I'm a teacher and I think of math. Take 240, divide by eight. That's $30 a hoe. Split that in half, you go 15, 16 strong, that's $15. You know what, that's approaching the price of doing business at the Flying J. Oh. There are options. I urge you to look at Breckenridge, Colorado and Palm Springs. Thank you, Ms. Elroy. <laughs> Jose Gomez, followed by Paula Plunk, followed by Maurice Butler. Good evening, Councilman and, and uh, the newly elected mayor. Um, your dad just uh, welcomed me and thanked me for visiting his country. So I just wanted to tell you it was worth every penny of it in my life, okay? Um, I'm in the same boat. I live on Edgerton, 363 Edgerton in San Bernardino. It's the hill on the hill that catches fire every two years. We lost 11 houses already up there for fire. They've all, most of them have been rebuilt except for two. It is a risk and a high fire risk. This year, we have now four B&Bs. When they're rented on the weekend, you can't find a place to park on the street. The city did a great ordinance. They came up and tagged our whole street on one side so nobody could park there, so the fire trucks and the ambulances could come up there when we needed them. And on a weekend, they can't come because there's cars parked all over. The first Airbnb at the very top of Edgerton had 70 cars and the police department came with 10 vehicles and ran them all off and closed the place down. All that did was that the Airbnb person that had it fined them, took their deposit and rented it again. So what was learned by that? Absolutely nothing. The house on Skylark is in the same boat. There was over 60 people at that house with a whole mass of cars parked on both sides of the street. There are so many retired people on that hill. We have five ailing people on the hill to include my sister that's in hospice care. If I needed an ambulance on a weekend, I can't get one up the street because the Air Airbnb is there. And all those people are partying. And it says we rent only to 12. 12 what? Not 12 people, because 12 bring 24, and they bring 48. It doesn't happen. It is the worst place, and the fires are the worst up there. I've been there 37 years. I've gone through seven fires. Almost lost my duplex next door. And I have tight, there's tight restrictions on my duplex. I have to have a permit. I have to pay the city uh, a permit to rent the part. These people don't have to do anything. I'm asking you to really consider Airbnbs in a fire-rated area. If anything, a fire-rated area. Our survival is based on what you guys do with this Airbnb thing that you're bringing on board. Because I'll tell you what, if it doesn't work and you can't put a tight restriction, our houses are not gonna be, and I, I, I bought my house. I'm living there, my family lives there. But three, one family owns three of them and they've made it a business up there. And why they picked our neighborhood, I have no idea other than we have a hell of a view. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Again. Gomez. Paula Plunk, followed by Maurice Butler, followed by Malibu. Good evening, Council, Mayor Tran. Thank you for remembering the community of character traits, the city charter code of conduct in your decision for the interim CM position. Hopefully he can revisit the community character traits, the code of conduct mandated by the city charter to help all of you to reimagine and move San Bernardino government to a positive environment to conduct business, not bias. 
the agenda. Use of the consent calendar is a hot mess. Using the consent calendar to push items through without public input is immoral and unethical, especially if it involves the finance department. It's called responsibility to those you all serve. Maybe the interim CM can address this in future meetings. To the representative from BB&K from the CA's office, Mr. Thomas, well, love that for you, that you find semantics is going to be your go-to, while not understanding your position during a community that provides your income. Uh, $15,000 a month, I mean, I'll just take a wild guess. No action or action is reportable. Thank you for doing that tonight. Also, Mayor Tran, you did not answer the question, why are you already finding favor with some residents, not all residents, with the outcome of the CES meetings? That looks unprofessional, Mayor Tran, please do better. Maybe you can use the word announcement on the webpage for the vote outcome so the CM doesn't have to get involved with semantics. The seating of the CW Ibarra to represent the city concerning our unhoused. Well, that's interesting. I would provide video, Ms. Ibarra, if you're going to fear monger about the unhoused. It's an interesting choice, Mayor Tran. You might want to remind her she has to she is held to the code of conduct under the city charter. No shows, slow shows, and closed session meetings is lazy, sloppy government. Hope her alternative does better in representing if she is not available. Code of conduct and city charter is becoming a paid item from the city clerk's office. Disturbing that residents must pay to read and absorb the city charter and code of conduct. The diocese and city management must have a transparent government something Mrs. Shrett always touts at us. Oxbow, after the correct decisions not to grind on site, the pit of hell called Oxbow will be abated and moved out of San Bernardino. No more race baiting from Teddy Sanchez, CM Ward 1, and no more no votes concerning the health and safety and welfare of the children of San Bernardino. Please review the first, first paragraph of the city charter. Most importantly, from our family to Dr. Trejo Ortiz, for your devotion and building attitude to do the hard work for the council to make the concrete and great decisions based on facts, not feelings. We say please and thank you to Treasurer Ortiz never to stop to her doing the hard work. Please follow Rise Up San Bernardino Facebook page and other SMPs. She is a treasure for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plunk. Maurice Butler, followed by Malibu, followed by Jocelyn uh, Sanders. Hello, my name is Maurice Butler. Um, I'm standing in, uh, in, uh, in the place of my community where I've been uh, born, at, born and raised in San Bernardino. I've lived in a little Zion Manor uh, apartments on the west side of San Bernardino in Ward 6. I live in now the Dorjade Estates where we have been recently purchased by uh, Bridge Management and we've been lied to, took advantage of, and just actually humiliated. Now they wanna come in and promise us these things that they never actually ever intended to give us. Now they're trying to uh, push a large eviction uh, formation to all of the, the tenants that has been there for over 20 years. And like right now, we need some help from the city council to actually step in and actually give us some legal, some legal representation to help us fight these, these slumlords that have actually taken over this property that has actually, before they took it over, has actually put us in this same position that they've been keeping us in. We have, we're infested with uh, rodents, mice, mold, pigeons, uh, just everything that you can imagine, falling ceilings, and they expect for us to pay our rent to them, but they didn't come in there and fix anything. They sit and make appointments with us to come fix things, have us stay home from work, never show up. We sit there and wait for them to show up. They never contact us, let us know anything. But we're standing right now to ask for some help from the city council. My auntie in general, my auntie is, I live in her, her ward. I've been living in that ward for all my life. I'm 51 years old now. I've lived over there ever since I was eight years old. So I've seen it go up, down, around, upside down. And my auntie, rest in peace, is actually the owner 
of the, and the the for, um the um creator of the Little Zion Manor and the Dorjo Estates, Vivian Nash. So I've been a, a, a law abiding citizen all my life here in San Bernardino, and right now I'm asking for some help, some legal representation, some genuine legal representation to help us because if not, we're going to be in the same line with all the other homeless people that they're actually been up here talking about right now. So right now. I'm just asking for some genuine help, some legal representation to help us battle uh, bridge management. They're actually trying to take over San Bernardino from us. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They're really trying to take over and rent to people that doesn't have any morals or anything like that. But I would like just ask people just give us some help. This is not the first time you guys heard about this. I think it was the last time too. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butler. We will have staff follow up to provide you options. Malibu? Yes, how you doing? Wow, I, I was gonna say a few things, but I wanna piggyback off of what he just said because I wanted to thank you guys for coming out and supporting me in my different events and this and that. And moving forward, I would like to see second ward and sixth ward get just as much attention, meaning money, as all the other wards, right? But I wanna stay right here with them for just a minute because that's really important. Because right now we have a crisis in San Bernardino of homelessness, right? And the county declared uh, racism as uh, an emergency, right? So we got the emergency called by the, by the county for racism and then you guys are gonna call uh, um, emergency for homelessness, right? So look, we, we got, we're, the door jails is mostly colored people, right? So we got the race right there. We got the homelessness potential right there. We should really visit that. I know a lot of times we come up here and say things and you guys can't really respond, but I, I, this is one of the things I'm going to probably get involved in and make sure that somebody gets involved in it because a lot of times we say that we're going to get in these positions and help everybody, but that doesn't happen. And a lot of times I come up here and invite you guys and you guys don't show up to my stuff. And I do a lot of stuff in this community for free. I'm not one of the people who has gotten any grants from you guys and so um, I'm thankful for the support that I have gotten from you guys I'm very thankful but this is something that we really need to pay attention to and because it's on the sixth ward a lot of you will not even pay attention to it you'll sit up there and walk off and, and vote for the dogs to get saved yeah. don't do that <laughs> let's not do that let's not do that Let's not do that. I, I, I often um, battle with people about supporting you guys, from the chief to you guys, everybody, and, and, and it's with goodwill, but we have to do better. I know that there's a grant out there for homeless. That $3 million isn't nothing that they just got for that resource center, right? So let's just be honest and be, be for real. If we're going to do something about it, do something about it. If we're not, then just say you're not, and so we can start the battle, because this year I'm ready to fight. All right. Thank you, Ms. Malibu. Joc Jocelyn Sanders, followed by former Councilman Ricky Van Johnson, followed by uh, former Mayor uh, Pat Morris. Yes, yes, I'm Jocelyn Fizal Sanders, and I'm here again um, for the door gels. Um, I've been coming and coming and coming. So now we're at the ninth hour, we're starting to get evicted. Evicted, why? Nobody knows because um, it's a sad thing that said that we were HUD. Everybody know the deal about it, but we don't have anyone to face a judge and tell the judge the truth. There's only two in the whole um, city, um, what you want to call them, um, legal aid representatives that don't even want to fight for you. Don't even want to get up to tell your story or anything, so we're being evicted because our story can't be told. But what we do need is we do need a lawyer to go, a qualified lawyer to go that, to court with us to tell the judge the truth. Yeah, the truth, the whole truth. The city knows the truth. The city knows the truth. Ms. Calvin, you know the truth. And it needs to be told. We get up there to swear, the, to, to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, but nothing get told but a bunch of lies. So I say this, homeless problems is done at the courthouse. Every day, everybody that's go to court, they're, they're assured to get evicted. There's no help, there's no legal representation. You know, how do you 
um, just rescind on some HUD property and the city don't even know about it, but then still evict the tenants that live there for 20, 30 years, give them 30 days to move out. They've been there for 30 years, some of them. And you only want to give us 30 years when you promised us 10 years to live there under a HUD-funded program. We can, you can't do that to these tenants anymore. Every, it should be a mandate on these t um, laws that protect tenants. What happened to tenants' rights in the city of San Bernardino? What happened to AB 1482 for affordable house housing? Who's telling the judge those stories? Who's telling the judge that that was once HUD property that we lived on? Nobody's telling the truth. So tomorrow, tomorrow is the next person going to eviction court. I was told someone was gonna call them to this evening. No one's called her. No one's called her, so now how are you going to be able to tell her story tomorrow at court when she needs to face the judge and so she can have a, a, a fighting chance? Mm. What happened? I don't know. So I guess tomorrow morning we'll see somebody there from the city, and I hope they'd be equipped with the whole story because we need some help. It's, 30, it's 36 of us. I think it's about maybe 30 now, but it's going fast. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Again, staff will be following up with you for our options. Former Councilman Ricky Van Johnson, followed by former Mayor Pat Morris, followed by Ashley Diaz. Good evening, Mayor, Honorable Mayor, awesome City Council members. It's a pleasure to stand here in front of you today. And I just want to say congratulations on winning your elections. Happy New Year, uh, Theodore, Sandra, F Mayor Pro Tim, Fred, and also the Honorable Mayor. Uh, you guys, as I see it from looking from the outside in, are definitely moving in the right track together. So I just want to thank you and applaud you for your service. Chief Goodman. Thank you for your service to the city in a short time. Calls of service have gone down. Morale in your department has gone up. And that's true leadership. Yes. Thank you. I also want to just applaud your choice on bringing back Charles McNeely to our city as manager. I had the opportunity when I sat there for working for at least seven city managers in my time there. And Charles McNeely was head and shoulders, talent-wise, above all of them. You guys are getting a top-tier city manager. Utilize him. Learn from him. Work together for him. Staff, you will appreciate his leadership. He will value you and your input. The residents of our city one of the things he did when he was here the last time, he took all the department heads and put them on a bus and toured the city of San Bernardino so that they could see actually the city that they serve. Because not that many department heads live in the city of San Bernardino. So they, when they, you come in and you drive out, you don't actually get to see what the citizens uh, uh, see on a daily basis. So the residents, you will have somebody that's going to be a champion for you. One of the things that he did when he was here, he didn't uh, adhere to any council member. It was if you brought him something, he shared it with everybody else. Because the philosophy he had was a rising tide lifts all boats. So welcome back, Charles McNeely. Thank you. For, former Mayor Pat Morris, followed by Ashley Diaz, followed by Kristen Malaby. Madam Mayor, good evening. Congratulations and welcome to the dais. Uh, council members re-elected, congratulations. And uh, you've got four great years ahead of you, I trust, as a unified city council. Um, I'm here to uh, not only congratulate you and welcome you back 
uh, to the dais, but also to congratulate you on your good judgment and indeed your wisdom to um, invite uh, Charles McNeely back uh, as our interim city manager. During my eight years as your mayor, I had the privilege and the honor of um, recruiting some of those city managers that Ricky Van Johnson talked about. And he had it right. Uh, the one city manager who stood uh, tall in his job uh, during his tenure with us was Charles McNeely. You on the dais know the facts about his history, but you should know um, a little more, the public should know a little more about the fact that he is a distinguished graduate of the University of Kansas School uh, of City Management. Indeed, he served as the um, director of that program after his graduation. He served a number of our cities in the state and beyond as city manager, uh, Palo Alto, Seaside. And I first knew him uh, when I was a judge. I taught uh, in a program called the National uh, Judicial College in Reno at the University of Nevada. And in my tenure there as a professor uh, in that school, I saw the renaissance of the city of Reno. It was remarkable. Um, and at the time, I wondered who was responsible for that kind of uh, resurgence of the business community and the general attitude of the um, electorate about their city. It turned out when I became the mayor of this city, I had the chance to uh, recruit this man who was the essence of that renaissance, the Charles McNeely, to come to our city. He had spent 13 years in his capacity as city manager of Reno and did an incredible job of bringing that city uh, to full blossom. He served us well for three years in this city, and he will serve you well. Uh, Ricky Van Johnson has described some of the uh, attributes of his personality, but when we invited him into the city, he moved into the city. He and his family moved here, bought his home here, lived here among us, understood fully uh, who we are and what we need in good city governance. So simply to say thank you for your wisdom and good judgment, uh, he'll serve you well as you begin to look for a long-term permanent city manager, he will do his job and honor you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Morris. Ashley Diaz, followed by Kristen Malaby, and then uh, followed by Betty Daniels. Hello. I was inspired recently to start attending these meetings, and congratulations, Ms. Mayor. Um, Really, I was just looking at this and I wanted to bring up the discussion on 35 about staff to work with the mayor and city council and such. I think, I feel that if these people have a dream and these people want to make things better, they don't want to make things worse, that they need to have staff that follow that dream, that believe in that dream, whether it be volunteers or more staff. I, and nothing else can get done, right, if we don't have a village. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Kristen Malaby, followed by Betty Daniels, and then followed by Miriam Nieto. Good evening, city council and uh, community. Um, wow, it really sounds like, uh, like change, like change is um, ready to be embraced by this community here. I am Kristen, I run SoCal Trash Army, which is a community grassroots RAN organization that services mostly San Bernardino, but pretty much all of the Inland Empire. <clears throat> I came tonight to invite everybody here to attend the Inland Empire Hounds men's professional basketball game this Sunday. Um, for information, please see their Instagram on the Hounds Inland Empire. Um, they need support. I've been working with them. They are community-driven men, positive dad image, um, image towards women. And um, so I'd like to ask the community to please come and embrace them. Um, also, <clears throat> the hottest topic tonight, the unhoused. Mr. Councilmember Reynoso, I appreciate you so much in your efforts regarding the warehousing. I am in this place serving the community now because of my position in a warehouse. I worked for the golden child of warehouses, Costco, and I earned my disability five years ago. I began my organization kind of off as just to see how I can get the community involved and find a importance and a place for myself again. 
Being on the streets I serve weekly, I find many people like myself who are disabled. It's further beyond that. These people are not receiving their SSI, and those who should be receiving it, it's not enough to afford housing. Most of these people actually receive a check, but cannot afford to live in the city they were born in. <clears throat> Over the last three days, I've been on the streets doing interviews of the unhoused. Not one person said they were from LA, and actually the majority of them were from San Bernardino. <clears throat> these are our homeless. This is our responsibility. There are so many who would love to work with the city. We are grassroots. Me, Sisters Making a Difference, Malibu, we're all on the same team. We've came together no matter what and who we are as individuals, but to see the collaborative images of what we could have here. We are begging council. We are asking city to open your eyes and also open your doors to people who may not have degrees, but have street smarts. You cannot earn degrees in that, but we know what we're doing and we know how to make relationships with these people who so much need medical, mental, who need guidance, and honestly, they just need something to live for. It's so easy to create jobs here in a warehouse, but let me tell you, there is not much hope in that, and your community of unhoused will grow on top of what it is now if we don't tackle it together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malaby. <clears throat> Betty Daniels, followed by Miriam Nieto, followed by Jerry Owens, and followed by Robert Porter. Good evening. I'm, um, my name is Dr. Betty Daniels. I'm an OBGYN physician. Um, been here in the community for going on 40 years now. Um, we, have a, we provide complete OBGYN services to the community deliver 40 to 50 babies um, a, I'm sorry, um, a month you. here. In, Can you lift the mic? Thank you. <clears throat> we deliver 40 to 50 babies a month here in San Bernardino between the two hospitals, St. Bernardine's and Community Hospital of um, San Bernardino. Um, we've had a problem recently in our business that I would like to make the city aware of and ask for help and, and some type of information on what we can do. Um, we've um, enjoyed a parking easement with Bank of America for the, what is it, 35 years we've been at the 249 location. We own a building at 249 East Highland. Um, the next door neighbors at 247 East Highland have over the last five to six years had marijuana clinics that have opened and closed. Over the last, say, 12 to 18 months, there's been a... Um, a new service there is a marijuana clinic, but what happens is there's always loud noise, loud music, there's the smell of marijuana going throughout our parking lot, penetrates into our building next door, and because of it, we've had a lot of our patients have left and gone to other, other facilities for treatment because of feeling unsafe in our area, in our parking lot. Um, I have a recent Yelp review that I'd just like to share um, two months ago. It says, the location of the office is terrifying. I don't care that it's in San Bernardino, but it's right next to a weed dispensary and everyone looks like thugs. The smell is absolutely atrocious, and as you are walking up to the GYN clinic, it makes you feel sick and nauseated. It also can't be good to inhale any of that smoke while pregnant. Um, we've had probably about three police raids that have, come, that have happened where people were lined up in handcuffs right in our front door as our patient is trying to come in for OBGYN services. Um, we've tried many things. We put a gate on the front of our building in order um, to prevent people from coming through our office to get back to the marijuana clinic. We spent over $25,000 upgrading our parking um, lot, putting in speed bumps, and also um, 
put up signs to try to um, stop people from parking close to the clinic so our pregnant people can walk to our office and not in the middle of the summer when it's 100 degrees have to walk from the end of the parking lot or not find a place to park. And so we have a parking spot that says this is for expectant mothers only. So when they stop at the weed clinic to get their weed, I'm like, well, what about our pregnant patients? They have no way to get there. So I would really just like some um, help in telling us what to do or what else we can do to try to save this um, service that we provide for the community and keep our business um, alive. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Daniels. I, staff is going to follow with you right now to get your contact. Miriam Nato, followed by Jerry Owens, and followed by Robert Porter. Good evening, and um, welcome, Mayor Helen Tran, and congratulations again. And I am here, uh, I, my name is Miriam Nieto. I am co-director with Just San Bernardino. I am also part of the San Bernardino Airport Communities Coalition. And I am here because of the meeting that was held on January 12th with the gateway specific plan. Um, thank you, Councilman, Councilman Ben Reynoso, and thank you for being there. And, and you got to witness how uh, sad and how bad uh, just everything was around that, that engagement with the community. Um, I do feel like we owe it to that community. Most of the community that came out for that specific meeting were Spanish-speaking community members. There was no, there was one interpreter there for maybe 50 people who showed up who were uh, Spanish-speaking. Um, there was community members who were just leaving the area because they did not understand the process uh, that they were being engaged in. They didn't understand what they needed to do. There was nobody there to really give them an understanding of what was happening. Um, therefore, just community members would just leave. Uh, Again, we, uh, some of the organizations that were there, were doing our best to support and interpret for, for some of these residents, but um, that is not our job. Our job is not, we're not interpreters, we're not official people who can give that support, and we were doing our best to give that support to our community, and we just, we just didn't have that. Um, or they didn't have that, right? And also, the signs were all in English, nothing was printed out in Spanish. Um, it, everything was just not right for the community. So I do hope that there is another community engagement plan and that it will be intentional this time with enough interpreters there for the community, for the Spanish-speaking community. Um, and I hope that maybe more of you guys come out to actually see um, how there's intentional engagement for this process. And um, again, thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Owens, followed by Robert Porter. Good evening, Mayor. Um, I believe his name, the gentleman on the far end, is Weeks. I just showed him a video, and if you'd like to see it, I'd like you to come down here and look at it. Over on Mountain View and Fifth Street at the Arco gas station, you got a lane. It turns right only. I drive straight, I need to go to the Arco gas station or any of the inconvenience stores in there. And then I gotta get over to the right. Cars come through there, straight. They don't turn. Buses have the right of way, which I didn't know until the night before Christmas. I went and followed the bus because he came straight across. The guy showed me the sign when I talked to the supervisor of the bus company over there and it needs to be changed back. The video I show, show, I don't know exactly what all happened, but the, a lamppost landed on this lady's car. I'm glad she didn't have no kids. I'm glad she was okay, but her car was demolished. I have that video. It needs to be changed back the way it was, to left instead of the right lane, have that going straight or turn right before somebody's dead. I go to the Arco gas station there a lot. If I'm trying to get over and a bus comes or some person decides to go straight and I got to slow down, I'm going to get hit. Yes, the bus company will get sued for it, but this, I will come after the city more than anybody else because I've been after this city to get that change back. I don't think the city of San Bernardino wants to get sued again. 
and lose millions of dollars. The other problem I've been doing, dealing with is with uh, Figueroa, with Rialto Avenue, from the freeway bridge down here from I Street all the way up to Pepper, needs to be fixed properly. It still ain't being done. I've been after the city for 13 years to try to get that street done. It's not done yet. I'm still waiting on from uh, your city maintenance people to call me, not being done. Nothing is being done. Potholes are there, yeah. Go up the street, sit there and look at how many potholes has been filled over the years. Go sit at the Mount Vernon and Fifth Street at the Arco gas station. See how many cars and trucks go straight across and how many people turn into the Arco gas station and stuff. Let's get it done. It needs to be done. I even, with your, uh, since you've been sworn in and everything, I've been to your office three times to make an appointment to see you. When can I sit down and sit with you like I did with the other mayors and talk about this and see the problems and get results? Tonight I was supposed to be the first person to speak. The lady up there has a list. It comes down to this lady on the end down here. If I'm correct, now I'm speaking now. Why wasn't I the first person to speak? Thank you, Mr. Owen, and I do apologize. That was an oops on my part. I, the papers were not in order, and I did realize that was my mistake. So um, you should have gone first, and I do apologize. Apology accepted. And I will follow up with you as far as the meeting goes. Whenever you can have a meeting with me, I appreciate it. Thank you. A uh, Robert Porter, I also apologize to you because you're number two. Again, I apologize. I own that. Well, well I've been called worse, but um, <laughs> Mayor, uh, Council, good people. I'd like to congratulate uh, Helen Tran um, for winning the race and being our new mayor, and congratulate uh, 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 Council Member Theodore Sanchez, uh, Councilwoman Sandra Ibarra, and Councilman Fred Charette for, for multiple terms, which is a huge accomplishment in itself. Um, I'd also like to mention some honorable mentions. Uh, Lucretia Lou Dowdy, um, she is awesome. I mean, we did Christmas carols for seniors and um, the disabled. That was awesome. We, you know, she's done a, a burlesque show. She's she she has performances at local spots. She she did the the Martin Luther King event, and I I just think that you know maybe uh, we could have a. a something special where all of you together make her a citizen of the month, right? She's just awesome. So uh, props to her. Another honorable mention, uh, Councilwoman Sandra Barra for uh, doing four meetings and then showing up at our uh, um, uh, neighborhood association meeting for Paris Hill Park in uh, uh, Valencia. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do that and um, the residents did love to hear from you. Um, I'd also like one more honorable mention, um, uh, Director uh, Gutfeld for uh, fixing the Martin Luther King statue monument with temporary plaques at the bottom until we can get those fixed permanently. We appreciate you, those are awesome. Um, uh, I did a little research and uh, um, so uh, being the first female Vietnamese mayor in the United States, um, the first uh, male mayor was Bao Nguyen of Garden Grove in 2014 but it's still a great accomplishment being the first female mayor. And that leads into my next thing. Um, wouldn't that in the future make for a great monument, right? You know, so San Bernardino, we're just trying to fix our monuments, but wouldn't it be cool to have other great monuments like Claretta Scott King, Dolores Clara Fernandez Huerta, Dr. Judith Valles, Dr. Margaret Hill, uh, Gloria Macias Harrison, I mean, the, the, some of them still around with us today. Wouldn't that be great to give them some cool monuments before they're gone? Okay, okay. Well, and Daniel Hernandez helped fix the monument over there. And uh, uh, monuments uh, can be, change the narrative of San Bernardino because we have a lot of negative news. So if we have some positive news, we can put out press releases to all the newspapers, including the New York Times and LA Times, for some of these people. And um, also po other possible monuments, the McDonald's Brothers, Santos uh, Pacuma Manuel, uh, Lopez Vergas II, 1944, the Great Arrowhead, Arrowhead Springs, California Theater, the National Orange Show. We have incredible things here in our city that we could put some history up or uh, put up some mo more modern history and uh, really showcase the good things of San Bernardino. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I love San Bernardino. Thank you, Mr. Porter.
All right. Um, Madam Cedar Clark, do we have any remote speakers or ADA accommodations? We do not have any remote speakers, but I do have one comment to read into the record. Okay. okay. Comment for the City Council meeting, a resident of San Bernardino living in the west side in the Ward 6. As we enter a new year of 2023, we have a great opportunity to begin a positive and new direction in this city. Madam Cedar Clark, they can't hear. Oh, is there, oh, that's why. No? Thank you, Liddy. Okay, as we enter a new year of 2023, we have a great opportunity to begin a positive and new direction in this city we all love named San Bernardino. My congratulations to newly elected and historic Mayor Helen Tran, the first Asian to lead our city, and congratulations to Council Members Theodore Ted Sanchez, Sandra Barra, and Fred Charette for re-election to the Council. Believe it or not, our current San Bernardino City Unified School District Board of Education is Dr. Scott Wyatt, is the first Asian and Vietnamese heritage leading the district. I am looking forward to us moving forward in our city as we give independent thoughts and ideas during discussions of issue, but arriving at a consensus support once the council reaches a decision. I am sure each of you had your own views and criteria in making this decision on selecting an interim city manager but you somehow agreed in a consensus way to vote unanimously to select Charles McNeely, which in my opinion is a wise and good decision. I also want to thank Rob Field for the time he spent with us and especially hiring Darren Goodman as the city's first African-American police chief. In a city that is diverse as San Bernardino, it has brought us to this point where our leadership reflects the population it serves. Now, one of our challenges is to get the staff to be more representative of the city demographics with the greater portion of them to live in the city. The last data I viewed from Human Resources indicates only 26 of our employees and 7% of our sworn police officers are residents. That means a large percentage of our tax dollars leave the city every payday. In closing, thank you for selecting Charles McNeely as interim city manager, and thanks to Henoveva for honoring my request for the agenda and other public records requests in a timely manner. I promise I did not add that to his comment. <laughs> Happy New Year, Hardy Brown, Six Wards resident. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Moving on to discussion items. Um, first one is the short-term vacation rentals. Sir, can you put on your mic because we cannot hear you. Yeah. Mayor I was Trent. I was scheduled to speak and I I, 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 uh, I don't know if they overlooked it over oversight. Oh, sir, sir, it's under public hearing. I believe he said he submitted it online. We can double check um, tomorrow, but if you want to allow him to speak for the council, are you, we'll, we'll allow him to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric Martinez. Um, uh, good evening. Congratulations. Uh, glory to God, and I pray that he guides us in our decisions and, and protects us and grants us his mercy and grace. You know, um, I'm a special education teacher for 15 years, and I have to be an optimist in my line of, of, uh, my line of work. But there's something that's concerning me. Um, it's the paranormal circus. Um, and it's because it may affect the youth, you know, and future events of, well, quite frankly, demonic nature here in San Bernardino. And why are we opening these doors of, of demonic nature? You know, I understand freedom of speech and whatnot, but we have enough going on in the city, you know. Um, why test God and his favor with the city? Um, as someone was mentioned before, it's a divine appointment, you know. And um, what are the what are the consequences of hosting such an event as this? God knows it can't be good ones. Um, what actions will this cause on young, fragile minds, and more importantly, their spirits? Why open these doors again? Um, I understand that it brings in money, but it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, this should be about all the citizens of, of all ages in San Bernardino. We should not be solicited by the organizers of this event. Um, and as far as homelessness, you know, I, I realize there's a lot of street 
street evangelists out there that are feeding the homeless and helping them on their own time, you know. And I, I, I hope that you continue to pray for them and acknowledge them and maybe even fund them. Uh, uh, they, they will rename na nameless because their, their, their glory and honor is going to be by God, you know, and their reward in heaven. But they are out, they are out there, you know, uh, helping the homeless. Um, and I'll end with this. Um, Satan once tempted Jesus Christ, and Jesus rebuked him and said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so are we as a city willing to test the all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God? Um, may God grant us his mercy and patience. I pray that and ask that you cancel this event and not have it ever come back. Um, thank you for your time, and may God be with you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, that's uh, everyone? Yes, that okay, thank you. Okay, back to discussion items. Um, the first one is the short-term vacation rentals in San Bernardino. Could we begin with the staff's presentation? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the staff is bringing forward uh, this item in response to the council's direction to establish regulatory framework for short-term residentials. Um, rentals and you may recall that both council member Sanchez and council member Alexander had brought this topic forward under items to be considered at a future meeting today's the meeting and uh, Nathan from CED will be providing three options for your consideration with one recommendation Good evening, Honorable Mayor, distinguished members of the City Council. Again, Nathan Freeman, your Community and Economic Development Director. Uh, I bring forward to you tonight a update on the state of short-term vacation rentals in our community. Uh, this has been requested of me on several occasions, and I've heard from most of you uh, and your constituents in my short tenure here at the City of San Bernardino. And I think you've heard from a couple of our public speakers that this is a, a real issue affecting our community. Uh, as I go through this presentation, just a couple of, uh, uh, I would say, straightforward information. There are currently, as part of the San Bernardino Municipal Code, no regulations for short-term rentals in our community. And because there's been no regulations, we've seen some of the uh, things that uh, a couple of our speakers have articulated for you in terms of traffic, noise, et cetera. So really quickly, I think we're all familiar with what a short-term vacation rental is, so I'm gonna skip ahead to what is happening right here, right now in the city of San Bernardino. And as you can see on the screen, uh, based on myself and my staff's research, since I would say the onset of the kind of Airbnb phenomenon, there have been 408 historical listings uh, here in the city of San Bernardino. In 2022, there were 200 listings for short-term vacation rentals throughout the city. And as of today, there are 120 active listings for short-term vacation rentals in our city. And I think it goes without saying that uh, when we have events like the raves at the National Orange Show that bring up to 100,000 people to our community, I have seen the, the effects uh, I've witnessed it myself, I've heard from our elected officials and from your constituents as well. I've seen pictures of people renting out tents in their backyard, 30, 40 cars clogging up roads that would make it impossible for emergency vehicle to respond to a real emergency. And some of the, the complaints are well known, noise, traffic, parking, property damage and trash. Uh, I can also report that unlike some of our neighboring communities, the city receives no transient occupancy taxes uh, related to the use of short-term vacation rentals in our, proper, uh, in our city. Uh, I can tell you just based on my simple math, had we had transient occupancy taxes and acted on these short-term vacation rentals, the city would have netted uh, approximately $100,000 just last year alone. And uh, on top of that, as the, the, the mayor and council know, we are experiencing a housing shortage right now, both in the rental and the for sale market. And most of the short-term vacation rentals in our, in our community are owned by out-of-town uh, investors. So what we have done uh, as staff, uh, in collaboration with our city attorney's office, we are presenting to you this evening three potential options to address this very important issue. 
As you can see on the screen, potential option number one would be a total ban. Now, as, it's, as you can see, the city could adopt and implement specific revisions to the San Bernardino Municipal Code that would ban short-term vacation rentals outright in the residential zones. And a, a clear prohibition would be more effective in deterring violation because it would cause less confusion among homeowners. And you can see some of the challenges associated with that is that it could potentially restrict the rights of homeowners. And uh, I think it goes without saying that not everybody who is renting a uh, short-term vacation rental uh, is doing it the wrong way. There's a lot of people doing it the right way. And I would say enforcing an outright ban would be difficult. Uh, as I think the council knows, we're at about 20 code officers right now, and it would, a, it would be a, a significant strain on code to be able to have to go out and enforce these on a full-time basis. So option number two, which staff is representing, would be to develop a regulatory scheme for this, much like most communities in Southern California have done. So myself, my staff, we had a chance to reach out to other communities that are dealing and grappling with the same issue that we are. We talked to the cities of Lake Arrowhead and Big Bear Lake and a lot of the communities out in the desert area. And what you see before you is by no means a final list. This is just some uh, that we cherry picked that other communities have implemented to address this issue. And should the council agree with staff's recommendation, we would develop our own regulatory scheme that would be uniquely San Bernardino. So you can see in other communities, some of the rules and policies are that short-term vacation rentals are limited only to specific residential zones. A business license and permit would be, uh, is required in some communities. Uh, in other communities, again, homeowner, or th homeowners are paying transient occupancy taxes to the city uh, as uh, privileged to, to operate that type of business. Uh, in other cities, the maintenance of the residential character of the neighborhood or the residential uh, where the property is located has to be respected. And in other communities, a minimum duration of time for rentals. For example, you could uh, enact a policy that says there must be at a minimum two nights. And uh, something that uh, obviously is very important, the limitation of parking so that some of the issues that the, the speakers have articulated would be addressed. And then uh, potential provisions for citation processes, enforcement, and penalties for violations could also be included. And then potential option number three to adopt a wait and see approach. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the San Bernardino Municipal Code does not expressly prohibit short-term vacation rentals. So we could take a, a step back, uh, see how this all plays out. Uh, and then we could attempt to enforce these on a case-by-case -case basis as we receive complaints. So before I move into recommendations, we did have a chance at the January Planning Commission meeting to vet this with them. The Planning Commission uh, passed a, a motion, not a resolution, to recommend that the City Council uh, adopt a, or agree with staff's recommendation to adopt a regulatory scheme that we would take back to the Planning Commission uh, hold a workshop, most likely in February, uh, and develop something that we can bring back to the full City Council for your review and consideration. So with that in mind, our recommendations are that the City Council receive and file an update on the current state of short-term vacation rentals in our community and to direct staff to develop a regulatory scheme for short-term vacation rentals. Uh, that concludes my presentation, Mayor, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation and the work you put into this. Um, do we, uh, do any members of the council wish to discuss or have any comments? Um, yes. I, I, move, I move the staff recommendation. One, one second, members. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll second. Bear with me, it's my first meeting. <laughs> I have, um, I'm showing council member Alexander has requested to speak and council member Sanchez. Okay, so we, uh, Council Member Alexander first? Yes. Thank council you, Member Mayor. Alexander? I now see Council Members Calvin's request. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Director Freeman, for your presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I was at that Planning Commission meeting when we, uh, when you guys, when the Planning Commission authorized or at least approved option number two. One thing that I would like to infuse, so if you get your pen out so you don't, you don't forget, is, um, and Madam City Attorney, make sure we can do these type of things is uh, the maximum nights of stay. If, if that's 
if that's legal, if we can tell people the, the maximum amount nights of, to stay. And if so, um, you have two, I say, you know, three because of holiday weekends, no more than three. Um, as one of the public comment persons said, uh, fire rated areas, a band on fire rated areas all together so they can't do that. Uh, a band on um, parking on the street. If you can't park inside where you have to park, then you can't park on the street. Uh, I hate to use the word ban, but I'm, 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 but I'm, and a maximum of 120 in our city, total. So as ones fall out, another one can pick up a license to come in, but no more than 120 in the city. And, and, and I, I don't have a formula for that. I just thought it was a good round number, to be honest with you. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Director Freeman. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member um, Calvin? Council Member Sanchez. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Sanchez. Uh, yeah, my only concern is with the 120. Um, who gets to pick them, and are they all going to be on the north side of town and on the south side of town? Um, that's the difficult part. Um, if we regulate them, I mean, it's just like the same argument we're having about, it, it's the same thing where, No, I, I don't think that's a good idea either. Um, it's, it's like the argument about fireworks. People keep on coming to us and telling us we should ban legal fireworks. And then we ask them, well, what's your issue with the legal, safe and sane fireworks? Well, I don't have any issue with those, but I have an issue with all the, um, all the dangerous fireworks that create all this noise and ruckus and cause all these problems. That, so if we put a ban on legal fireworks, that won't solve your problem. That's the case here. If we bring them under the umbrella of city regulation, we won't have an issue with any of them. We won't have an issue with any of them because they will all be compliant. They'll all be following the same procedure. We had the same issue when we did cannabis, and that turned into millions and millions of dollars of litigation, claims of favoritism, claims of, uh, well, why, why does one get this proportion of, of, of licenses and why these don't? If we put them all under the umbrella of regulation, all the problems that the public speakers came and spoke about will go away. Uh, and I, I cannot support this. We've been through it once or twice before on license, uh, licenses, one for cannabis. Well, cannabis is the one that comes to mind. And look how that turned out. I cannot support the 120. I don't want a, a cap. I want thorough, uh, clear delineations of responsibilities. Um, and clear expectations of all the uh, all the sites that are going to have this short-term rental. So um, I I support uh, everything but the cap of 120. So uh, that would be my motion. So staff recommendation with the additions that Council Member Alexander recommended, except for the 120 cap. Yeah, that's option two, but it's also a hybrid with option two plus Council Member Alexander's recommendations, barring only the 120 cap. That's, that's my motion. I'll Thank you, that. Council Member. Next is the Council Member Calvin. Thank you, Mayor. So in listening to our constituents who are having issues with this no ordinance, no compliant, no laws that we have in place here, um, I think that you just mentioned, Director Freeman, that we don't have enough code enforcement officers to enforce the issues that we have in this city currently. Am I correct? Absolutely. I think that this would be, now I want the TOT tax. I would love to be able to have that. But are we in position right now to be able to service? You know, we can't just think about those dollars when we can't even assist the constituents right now who are having problems with the homeowners who are renting their homes uh, for, and I, it sounds like it's particularly for raves, because we don't really have any type of other events in our city uh, going on, conventions or anything like that. So the type of, of, of clients or people who are renting those homes probably are those that are going to the raves, which we know then that is um, making it even harder for our constituents to be able to be in their homes comfortably. I would like for us, you know, until we have something totally planned out, 
you know, revisit it. We don't have enough code enforcement officers. How many code enforcement officers would we need in order to regulate this new ordinance that we're talking about? Because we don't have enough to, rec to service the city as it is. I think we need to bring this back, and, and that would be my motion. Um, we, we cannot just uh, throw uh, something out there, hope that it sticks, hope that everybody's going to comply when we don't have enough code enforcement officers to enforce. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Calvin. Uh, Councilman uh, Charette. Yeah, I, could, could I get clarification? Are you saying the wait and see is? Okay, well, I, I absolutely don't want to wait and see on anything. And I kind of don't accept uh, an excuse that um, we don't have enough resources. I, that's the reality, I get it, but we've got to work in the direction of getting those resources and, and, and find the resources that we need to deal with the major issues that we have. Uh, so maybe redirection of some of our resources. Um, this is an, or I, I have to, full disclosure, uh, one of the speakers that spoke tonight is my neighbor, uh, who talked about four in our neighborhood. Um, my house is actually one of the houses that was impacted by a fire a number of years ago. Um, and uh, it, it is a high fire danger, but I have a hard time deciding, well, okay, so there's a high fire danger. I happen to be there, and the neighbors that live there, they'll benefit by a full ban in that area. Um, I was elected council member many years ago kind of as a businessman and a bus with a business background. Uh, it's hard for me to ban anything um, in, in terms of, of a, from a business perspective. But I also will not support inappropriate um, businesses or operations that disrupts, disrupt a, a, city, a community, whether it be a neighborhood or even a commercial area. Um, I'm not going to support the wrong type of business that doesn't coincide with, with the surrounding businesses. Um, I'm, I, I want to try. I'm after the, the TOT, of course. But $100,000 is not nearly enough. I, I've heard people from this dais say that uh, they would spend $10 million to, get, you know, to, to satisfy about a half a dozen constituents uh, with regard to the Oxbow issue. I mean, um, and so $100,000 in revenue um, to, that disrupts our citizens that live here um, is not enough, enough uh, uh, bang for the buck, in my, my opinion. We should be collecting that wherever we can, TOTs and other revenue streams, but it has to be, it has to be done effectively. Um, I, I don't want to put a cap on it because um, uh, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Councilman Sanchez says. I agree uh, wholeheartedly with what uh, Councilman Alexander said. Um, it, it is a problem that, that we don't have anybody down here clamoring to open these things, um, but we do have a number of citizens down here saying don't allow them and that they're, not, they're creating nothing but, but problems. I have a list of a number of people that uh, um, actually they had indicated they'd be here tonight to speak on this issue because it's all over the city. Um, one, of our, one of our speakers uh, happens to live in one of the highest rent districts, one of the most uh, valuable property in the town and he's being impacted by it. So it isn't uh, have anything to do with, um, with uh, dem demographics or values of homes or, or what have you. It's disrupting this city. And so for 120 people that don't even live in this town to benefit and disrupt, you know, those um, take 120 times 10 so what's that, 1,200 or 1,300 families and people that are impacted by those 120, I have a real problem. But I have a real problem with, um, with banning something outright. Um, I think uh, that we can trust staff. And by the way, thank you for this, and, and thank you for what you, what you, what you've, uh, uh, the work you've done on it. Uh, so I tend to agree that we should go with uh, item number two. And to my colleague, um, I don't know if we want to 
want to tell you tonight, we can give you some direction and some ideas of what should or shouldn't be in it, but it won't be set in stone. If you came back and said uh, a cap at 120, um, maybe we can uh, adjust that a little bit. So I want to try to be fair. I don't want to make it for one region of the city, one area of the city. Uh, but but it's it's been my understanding from a number of people from all p walks of life and all parts of the city that these Airbnbs, um, that's the, the generic term uh, for uh, tissue paper, Kleenex. It's an Airbnb, but we all know what it is. Um, it, it's it's not helping. It's not helping our city. And somebody said, why would you come to San Bernardino? Well, of course, we want a lot of people to come to San Bernardino. But unfortunately, some of the reasons people are coming to San Bernardino are exactly what you mentioned, raves and things like that. And these uh, facilities have turned into nothing more than party pads uh, for the weekend. And so short term, two nights, no way. Make it short term one week or two weeks. So there's a lot of options and a lot of things that we can talk about. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure exactly where we stand on motions or substitute motions, but I'm supportive of, of item number two and giving some input and getting some input. You're gonna say, did you say something about a workshop and, and uh, uh, maybe some uh, community outreach? I don't wanna wait too long to do this. It needs to be dealt with because we've been going on. And I, you know, you and I talked to, uh, initially on this thing when I had some real, it was prior to me being impacted personally on it, but it was some other people, other constituents that had called me and you said that you were somewhat shocked, maybe those are not the right words, but somewhat shocked that we had no, um, uh, no uh, regulations at all. And certainly we agreed that we need regulations on this type of, a, of an activity in business. Yes, sir. So just to, to clarify, because if the council were to direct staff to proceed with uh, option number two, because we were pot uh, potentially talking about amending the San Bernardino Municipal Code and potentially development code, that has to go back through the Planning Commission. So my my goal, should the council agree with staff's recommendation, would be hold that workshop at the regularly scheduled planning commission meeting in February. Okay, so, and, and move this kind of on a fast track to get it done and get it get it behind us yes, and sir. decide what we're gonna come up with. And as, uh, some of the comments or, or concerns that we all have during this period of time, we can talk to our planning commissioners, or we can talk to you, we can get input from the residents, and we can say, you know, we want, want it banned here, we want it limited here. We want the number of uh, nights uh, to be at this level. Uh, all these, all these lists of, of criteria that would qualify. And then heavy fines for noncompliance. Um, and um, I, I have some other questions. I'll go offline with you and ask some of the questions and see how you can answer them. Um, but but um, I certainly don't think we should wait and see and I'm not real thrilled about banning outright. I mean, yeah, if it was just me, I'd ban them outright, but it's not just me, and I wanna, I wanna take a fair look at this. So is that a second to my motion? No, oh. wait, wait, we have another council member who wants to speak. Thank you, council member Charette. Council member Reynoso. I'll be brief, because it's late. Um, can you pull up slide two, option two? I like, um, Pretty much everything that's on here, I think the two night, I don't agree with a ban. I think the two night minimum uh, will allow for us to catch like anybody who's just out of line. I've stated at many Airbnbs myself. There's restrictions if you have them in place. Although I agree wholeheartedly with Councilwoman Calvin about not having the enforcement, I still believe we should have the rules in place. And so I would like when I finish, Councilman Alexander, can you um, explain which are different that you mentioned from this list so that we can um, move forward? Uh, I wanted to add uh, a, a ban on fire rated areas where emergency vehicles can't get to. Um, right, right, exactly. Fire rated areas. Um, I, I did mention uh, it says two days. I said three. I, I, I can throw that out. I can, I can work with that. Um, um, I can work with that. Uh, there is one Airbnb that is where one of the constituents talked about that they have on their no partying 
that's what they put on their Airbnb. If that's an issue, I, I don't know. And then I said, uh, I said 120 day, 120 licenses, or that that was my that was my uh, difference. 120, 120 in the city, so we're not inundated with them. As one falls out, another one picks up. That was just my recommendation. That's all. Thank you. I also picked um, up that you had a ban on parking on the streets. Th thank you, sure thank you, you city attorney. I appreciate that. Yes, and, and you must park in your driveways. Yeah, yeah off the streets. Thank you, council member. Um, I we have councilwoman Ibarra. Uh, yes, I, I too. My concern with bans is that it might not even address the situation. I mean, we we look at other different bans like the ban or prohibition of the alcohol. What happened? People still did it under the radar without getting permits. So I, um, I actually, I stand behind the uh, staff recommendation of option two to adopt a regulatory scheme. Uh, I, I'm open for that workshop, invite the community to provide their feedback. Um, I personally, in the second ward, I don't, I don't have any Airbnbs, but when I travel, Airbnbs are a good way to bring in your friends. Um, parking does have to be limited, however. And I know when I travel, I get a rental car and I pick up my friends at the airport. I, they don't, or they get an Uber or a, a Lyft to get the property. So there, there should be no reason why these Airbnbs have 20 vehicles for one property. It's, it, it's just beyond me to find out that that's happening. And I apologize um, to our residents who are dealing with this because that should not be allowed. And we need to move forward with creating an ordinance that is actually gonna address everything. Um, so option two, I'm on board with that one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Madam City Manager, uh, City Clerk, can you um, go over the motion? So I have a motion that was made by Council Member Sanchez. There was no second, back. and then. Is it, is, isn't this going back to Planning Commission? All you want is a discussion well, and I, input, right? I need right? Your, your feedback and your input. Right. And I need you to, to direct me to go back to the Planning Commission to pursue option number two. I move for that. Mayor. At, at which one? Put to, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, this is, the, the, and look, I think this is kind of what everyone's saying here is that we kind of gave you a broad, this is what we want. Go look at it, study it, tell us, hey, council, we like this. This one might be a little difficult. What do you say? And we go from there. So I think all of us expressed a, a level of flexibility with the staff recommendation. So come back with, with everything that was mentioned here, and then we can throw things out, add things in, adjust. I mean, isn't that, are we all in agreement on that? I think that's what we want. Yeah, yeah. That, that was my motion, essentially. Uh, Director Freeman, would you please, though, make sure that enforcement and what this is going to do to the code enforcement department, we must take a strong look at that. That is an issue. Absolutely. And if there wasn't a second, I second Councilman Sanchez's motion then. I was I told ask? Council Member Figueroa seconded that motion. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I too agree with, with the code issue because that's, that's serious. And I think we've all said here from the dais that if we could have 50 code officers, we would, and I think we need them. And I'm gonna, I would, if, if we could get them, uh, I would uh, argue to find it in the budget to do it, because that's what we need to clean this city up, and we need it seriously. But it's not just a code issue, it becomes a PD issue as well, right? And in fact, uh, do you know if, if most of the issues have been code violation? Well, of course, there's no code, so they can't violate that, but the complaints and the issues that have, the cost to the city has been really law enforcement, hasn't it, for the uh, ones that we currently have? That is correct. Most of the complaints revolve around parking and noise. Parking, noise, and after hours. And, and, and after hours, which, which are typically police department Which responses. is a police department issue. That so is the correct. code enforcement might not be quite as, a concern, quite as much a concern. Well, not, not immediately, since there's no code since to there's enforce. No code. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of, which came first, the code or the violation? <laughs> Councilwoman Calvin. So then who would be managing in, in your department then? That is who would be overseeing Airbnbs or short-term rentals? And then you would have to have your staff is then who would be monitoring the regulations? That's correct.
Madam City Clerk, can you repeat the motion or that? Yes, the motion was to move staff's recommendation and move with option two, adding the recommendations stated by Council Member Alexander, which include a ban on parking on the street, uh, a ban on rentals in a fire rated area, um, do not include the exception of the cap on the 120 rentals. And that was a motion by Council Member Sanchez, seconded by Council Member Figueroa. Would you add something else to that? And that is that it's a longer than a two day stay. Let's say five days, three days. Two yeah. days is very, and remember, very oh, short. You, I think most rentals, I think they require uh, five days. I mean, three days. No? Sir, it's done on a, a case by case basis. I'm not sure there's an industry standard for how many. Uh, I know. I, I used to go fishing uh, mm -hmm. for for the the uh, opener up at Lake Crowley and our motel that we used to go to for uh, two nights. They finally decided they want us, so we had a limit. We we had to stay for five nights. <laughs> I don't know if that was a revenue stream for them or what, but uh, we can determine that. And and I think I think. Three nights or four nights is reasonable. So would you agree with that or at least look at it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, this is about, and you mentioned everything, but staff is going to take a look at this and they'll come back and we can, we can then, we can tweak it at that time. But you should start working on getting something back to us, right? Because right now we're just kind of throwing things at the wall. Well, yeah. Councilman, the, the feedback is much appreciated. Uh, the feedback we will take back to the Planning Commission and, and articulate for them what your thoughts and feedback were so we can make sure it's addressed. Thank you, Council Members. Madam City Clerk, can you go ahead and call for the votes? Votes are now open. Will you be voting on the item, Councilmember Figueroa? Okay. Give me one moment, please. Okay, I'm going to do that one more time if you can. Um, Put your votes in. Yes. Close the vote. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is the nominations and appointments to various regional boards and associations. Citizens, um, Madam City Manager, could you, can we begin with the staff's presentation? Yes, absolutely, thank you. thank you. So the item before you are the nominations and appointments of the mayor and council uh, to the various regional boards and associations as noted in the staff report, which would include um, Inland Valley Development Agency, uh, appointments to San Bernardino International Airport Authority, San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, Omnitrans, um, Interagency Council on Homelessness, and Southern California Association of Governments. Um, historically, the appointments, um, the appointment nominations have been made traditionally by the mayor and affirmed by the legislative body, the council. Um, the mayor's uh, proposed appointments are noted on page 39 of the staff report. I can go through them if you'd like. Should we go one by one? No, or it's okay. Back to I you. Think. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, Mayor. Um, one second. Do any members of the council wish to discuss or have any comments? Council Member Reynoso? Yeah, I have no problem. Um, 
with any of the appointments, I would just like to make uh, a substitute motion that the IBDA members be myself, Mayor Tran, and Councilman Calvin, with uh, Council Member Charette as an alternate. Second. I'd like to make a substitute motion uh, that we go with uh, Mayor Tran's recommendation for the regional board appointments. Second. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Sanchez. On the substitute motion? On the substitute motion. Yes. Council Member Ibarra. Yes. Council Member Figueroa. Yes. Count Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Reynoso? No. Council Member Kelvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Mayor Tran gets a vote on this item, correct? May. You sure? Okay, sorry about that. Passes three, four, five, five. Huh? Oh, sorry about that. Six to one. Council Member Reynoso voting in opposition. I'd like to give, actually, a Madam City Clerk, Council Member Reynoso, an opportunity to speak on why, if he'd liked. I needed to be on that board because. I worked on the outside of the efforts that are being moved forward on that board. The board is a yes man board and no one says or does anything out of the ordinary, but it's done. And so, yeah, that's fine. You're the mayor. Thank you, council member. All right, next is the adoption of resolution number 2023-19, appointing an interim city manager and approving an employment agreement. Assistant city, um, City Manager, could we begin the staff presentation? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So um, before you tonight uh, is the consideration of the interim city manager appointment. And as you recall, a special closed session meeting was held on December 14th with the mayor and council decided to provide staff direction to open up the recruitment. Consistent with that direction, the recruitment was open on December 19 and closed on January 6. There were a total of 25 applicants. On January 11, the mayor and council held a special closed session again where uh, they voted to move the top two candidates to interview. That was last night. You unanimously um, decided to move forward with the top candidate, Charles McNeely, and I do need to read a uh, certain provision in accordance to the government code when you're appointing an executive before I turn it back over to the mayor just for compliance purposes. And that statement is in accordance with government code section 54953C3, the legislative body is required to orally report a summary of a recommendation for final action on the salaries, salary schedules or compensation paid in the form of fringe benefits of a local agency executive during the open meeting in which the final action is to be taken. The item includes the approval of an interim city manager employment agreement. Under the agreement, the interim city manager would be paid at a rate of $137.02 per hour. In addition, and in accordance with CalPERS rules, the agreement provides for no other city benefits. That concludes my report. Motion to approve. I'll second. Do any members wish to discuss or have any comments on this item? Mayor Pro Tem, Charette. Thank you. I'll make a comment. Um, I was fortunate. Uh, you know, we had a lot of speakers speak tonight very highly of Charles McNeely. Um, I was fortunate to be elected uh, just prior to him coming on board, and so I learned. So, Charles, I'm you're the cause. Um, <laughs> he taught me everything he knew. 
He, he taught me everything he knew. No, I, I'll, all kidding aside, he, he was a terrific city manager. All the accolades and, and uh, responses and comments that were made tonight, I can vouch for. Um, it was a great loss when we lost him. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you back, Charles, to uh, help guide us through this uh, temporary period while we're looking for a, a permanent one. Um, and um, I hope it's okay if I call you Charles and not city manager. Temporary city manager. Like, kind of like temp CM, like mayor pro temp. <laughs> Congratulations and welcome aboard again. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Any other comments? If not, um, Madam City Clerk, call for the vote. Just for the record, um, Mayor, um, supplemental documents for this item were provided this afternoon to you all via email. They were also posted online for public review and copies were printed and provided here um, for the public. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Calvin and Alexander, your vote on this item? We need Charles. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Would I, please, Charles, we need to leave. Would you come down? And your wife as well. There's two chairs right here, right in the front. <laughs> Charles, would you mind saying a few words? We would love to hear from you, and uh, we are ready to rock and roll with you to get to work. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, it is indeed a pleasure for me to return. Um, I want to emphasize that's interim, though. Um, you know, I, I had, uh, during the process, as you know, the council members, and there were many questions that uh, you had of me, uh, and certainly I had questions as well. But as I indicated, um, when I was uh, first selected, um, it was for me an opportunity to work and serve this community, in a community which I love very much and still love. Um, I am looking forward to working with you and I am very impressed with the outstanding leadership um, that I have seen from the new mayor and the council members that are here. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you um, and to spend time with you. And as I indicated, you know, my commitment to you is to be here to support each and every one of you. Um, I think it's truly uh, important that as a professional, and I consider myself a professional, um, that I spend time in the community, um, that I'm here to support and work with you, that I and the staff are responsive to you. Um, but the bottom line is you are here, um, your expectations are that we will get results. Um, there's a sense of urgency now. Um, hopefully the, the uh, process doesn't take that long to uh, get a permanent uh, person in here and I will work with you in whatever uh, fashion uh, is appropriate to help you in assisting you in the process of recruiting. Um, I do have some expertise in that, but um, I will follow your lead. Um, but I want you to know that as for as long as I'm here, uh, you have me 100%, and I'm here to support you. And uh, as I also indicated, my commitment to you is each and every one of you um, will be treated equally. Your wards will be treated equally. Uh, in that uh, it's very important that we're responsive and the staff responsible to each ward and to each council member and to the mayor. Uh, so, and if you have an issue, um, my door is always open. Give me a call, and I hope to spend some time meeting with each and every one of you, the opportunity to sit down and talk and find out what your issues and concerns are so that we can move forward. So, again, 
I'm honored and, and thank you for the opportunity to come back and to help. Uh, I love the city and I'm also very committed to being out in the community and, and re getting myself reacquainted uh, with members of this community and getting the staff acquainted uh, with this community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. And I truly want to thank your boss yes. to your left. She's the boss. And <laughs> your, your beautiful wife, who is a bigger support of you to return back. And I knew that took some time. And so thank you. Thank you to your wife. Yeah. Thank you so much for allowing him to come back to work with us. And we are, we are just so um, elated and uh, mm. just eager for results driven and team. So thank you so much. And she is the boss. There's no question about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to public hearings. Oh. Councilwoman Calvin, would you like to say? Oh, no, good. Um, moving on to uh, public hearings. The first one is adopt new purchasing policy and, and introduce ordinance number. Um, MC 1605, amending section 3.04 of the Municipal Code. It is recommended that the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, introduce read by title only and waive further reading of ordinance number um, MC 1605, amending section 3.04 of the Municipal Code of the City of San Bernardino, California, and adopt resolution 2022-246, adopting the purchasing policy for the City of San Bernardino. I am opening the public hearing at 9.39 p.m. Could city staff provide a presentation on this item? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Barbara Whitehorn, uh, Agency Director of Administrative Services. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, I have a presentation if you would like me to go through it. Um, so this is the uh, presentation on the new purchasing policy and municipal code. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of background and then we'll talk about key changes to the municipal code and the policy and then um, some really what we talked about on December 7th, there was one change that council had asked to be made and then some important things to note within the policy and municipal code that uh, we think are important from a city and council perspective. So the current municipal code is very detailed. It gets into specifics of how and where to post um, advertisements for bids, how and where to post surplus items, all kinds of details that really are not typical in a municipal code. Usually you see that kind of thing in um, procedures, not even in policy. Um, so when, when I think about municipal code and then policy and then procedures, you think of code as like the governance, right? And then policy is the next level down and then procedure is even more sort of in the weeds, if you will. Our municipal code seems to get all the way down into procedural level, which is a little challenging because the way it's written, it doesn't leave a lot of room for where can we post bids, how can we post surplus items, things that really um, it probably should leave a little more room for, like job duties, things like that, that are are not probably best suited for municipal code. Not to say that our municipal code's wrong, it's just, it's just extremely detailed maybe in ways where it doesn't need to be. So this is really my, my sort of visual for you all for how sort of code versus policy versus procedure work is the governance and the code gives you the framework, right? You know, you give us sort of governance policy and you say, this is how we want it to look. And then we create a policy that says, okay, here are the rules that define that for staff. And then staff says, okay, now here's the standard operating procedure that make all of those things actually happen. So that's where all the detail is, sort of at the bottom of the triangle. <laughs> but the code should provide really the, the governance framework. 
and then we get policy has more detail and procedure is where we see the highest level of detail. So what we did when we went through the municipal code and the purchasing policies, we simplified the code and then we really went into much more detail in the policy and then of course procedure has the highest level of policy. So in doing that, we did some, um, these are basic things that we did. We clarified the thresholds for bidding and approval authority. We removed requirements for purchase orders for all purchases over $500 which is an extremely low threshold. We couldn't find any other cities that were that low. And we had assistance um, from BB and K in writing this um, because what we wanted to do was not just rely on staff. We wanted to have um, expertise outside of staff and they work with a number of other cities. So they helped us um, use comparisons with other cities. And then we clarified and improved the local vendor section which we, we felt was not um, robust enough. Um, in the bidding requirements, because I think this is one of the most important areas for council to understand, like who can sign and has authority to sign within the city. Um, purchases up to $10,000 um, can be uh, made using a procurement card or a check request, rather than having to get a purchase order or a contract. Purchases between 10,001 and 40,000 can have informal quotations and can be processed at the department level. They do have to have a contract, but they can be signed by a department or an agency director. Over $40,000 have to be formal competitive bidding or selection. Here are more the approval authorities. The agency department directors can sign up to 50,000. This was fairly standard across the board in cities. Some cities went higher than this. They went up to 100,000 with department directors, but we didn't feel that that was appropriate. Um, we felt that 50,000 was more of an appropriate level and that 100,000 was appropriate for the city manager and then over 100,000 um, was appropriate for the mayor and city council, that at that level it should come to council. And then we added um, for emergency pur purchases, which has always been a section in the municipal code, that there is an exception for emergency purchases, um, but we said that the mayor and city council shall be notice noticed within 48 hours of the emergency purchase. Um, because now with email and texting, it's really quite easy to notify council if there were a time at which we had to make an emergency purchase outside of a normal threshold. Um, I'm not sure what we would need to purchase for $100,000 plus that would be an emergency, but if we did, it's not as if we couldn't immediately notify council. Um, local bidders, this is a really important change. Our current municipal code only allows a 1% comparison credit for goods and services. Um, and the law allows up to a 5% comparison credit. So we increased the comparison credit to 5%, which is as much as the law will allow. Um, and we felt that that was appropriate because if we do have a local vendor bidding on goods and services, which of course uh, is defined as general services, maintenance services, and professional services, we can't use the local comparison um, preference if we're doing any kind of public works bid, that's not legal. But when we do use it, um, we think it's, it is important to give them the 5% rather than just a 1%. And just to recap again, um, the, the idea for us was to simplify it and really bring it into this sort of alignment with code being the governance, policy being more detailed, and then we do have a standard operating procedure manual that we're working on that right now is um, significantly more detailed than that. And then this is another way to look at it, that policy sort of bridges governance to day-to-day -to -day operations. 
and I think that is my last. Yeah, so the purpose was really to ensure compliance with all current laws and regulations. We want to promote transparency, establish standardized and cost-effective and efficient purchasing throughout the organization, um, and we want to ensure continuity of operations where we're not getting like bogged down in trying to get a PO for a $600 purchase that is really something that we should be able to easily purchase with a procurement card. Um, you know, we're at this point where we are getting kind of bogged down in, in some of those small purchases. We want, but we want fair competitive processes and I think this will promote that. We want to maintain integrity and fairness and um, we feel that this promotes all of those things. So these are the sections of the purchasing policy. I don't want to go through them all with you, but you do have a copy of it in your, um, in your packets. And I wanted to uh, note, because the original request for this item was for the purchasing division manager to have purchasing authority, we did find in, comparison, in comparing other cities that most purchasing division managers did not, and that was because they're the key control point. They're like the compliance officer for the city. And as that role, if we give them purchasing authority, then we have to have someone else be that compliance point. And we don't really have enough staff to make that happen unless you have a much larger purchasing division and you take the director's authority, you say, okay, we don't give director's authority, we give purchasing that authority, and you have a much larger purchasing division or department like you would see in a county. And often counties have that set up where you have like 20 purchasing agents and they're each assigned to a department <laughs> instead of a department having the authority to uh, sign, for, sign a contract or sign a purchase. That's given to a purchasing agent instead. But most municipalities do it the other way, where a director has authority to a certain threshold, and the purchasing division manager is sort of the chief compliance officer, if you will, for contracting and procurement. Um, also, disadvantaged <laughs> business enterprise and small business enterprise. We did hire the DBE officer, I think I mentioned this last time, our DBE specialist in um, December, and she is really rocking and rolling, like she is all over it. So we are excited that um, we're working on ensuring that we're inviting minority firms and small businesses to bid. Um, they're working on a 10-year plan for really expanding the DBE program. There are no, um, no cities or counties around us that certify DBE firms, which um, are purchasing manager was really surprised to find. Usually there is a county or somebody that does that, and there isn't here. Um, it's a fairly large undertaking, but at some point they are hoping that we can become that agency. Um, we requested additional, uh, oh, you all requested on December 7th, additional reporting for contracts of $40,000 and above that were signed by um, directors, agency directors, the city managers or their designees. Um, so basically anything in that um, requiring that higher level of uh, bidding where we, where we were gonna do formal bids and you ask that it be included in the city manager's report to council. So in both the municipal code and in the purchasing policy, we included the same language and we said that all contracts, we put it as purchases above $40,000, that all contracts in this category signed by the city manager, agency directors, directors, and or their designees shall be reported in list form to the mayor and city council at each regular city council meeting during the city manager update. And I hope I got that language exactly as you wanted it. I, I think I did. Um, and if not, um, we can read into the record any change that um, you might have to that. But that's the policy, and I have it just the same in the municipal code. And if you have any discussion or questions or additions. Thank you. Uh, we do actually have a speaker on this item, and that's Dr. Treasurer Ortiz.
great presentation. My one concern is that we really don't trust the books in this city. That if we're going to allow for uh, more money and larger numbers to move through, that you first have a fiscal audit done of the budget and where everybody is at. Because I'm looking and seeing that we're changing a policy where there was a $500 maximum, there was already a threshold, but yet the former mayor was allowed to uh, make purchases upwards of $10,000 with zero oversight. And our last CM was able to make purchases up to $49,999 with no cap. Now, it says we're gonna get updates at every regular meeting, but you guys can go months sometimes without meetings. We just did it for the Christmas break. So what happens when people are spending upwards of fifty dollars to $100,000? At what point do they have to stop? At what point when you're gone for a month, is it a maximum of a million dollars a week they're allowed to spend, or do they try to rush as much money as before the next two weeks? Like, when does a fiscal accountability happen? And how can you guarantee that all the money that we're supposed to be spending is there? Because my understanding from public records is that money has been passed out of this city without ever being put in front of the council, without ever being notified to the public. Where did that money go? That's gotta be the number one fiduciary responsibility before you change this code. I love the stuff about the bidding and local bidders. I think that's great and that's a good addition. But as far as anything else, can you tell me the true state of the money in this city? And if you cannot, please do not up the thresholds to allow more money to move with less oversight. Thank you. Thank you. Now, does it, um, I do have um, a comment by Council Member uh, Sanchez, followed by Council uh, Member Ibarra. Uh, so this policy does a good thing. It codifies uh, reporting, which didn't exist before. So we had ca uh, past city managers who would uh, voluntarily in their uh, council member, or sorry, council updates or city manager updates, they would, they would explain all their, uh, all their purchases under the spending authority. Um, but it was at their discretion. So what this does is this codifies that. Uh, but I do have a couple uh, minor amendments I wanna make that we can add. And so I think they're minor enough so we don't have to come back for a first reading and then a second reading. And that would be on slide seven. If we can go to slide seven. Uh, bullet point two, I see here um, purchases between $50,001 to $100,000 may be authorized, signed by the city manager and or their designee. So I would want to redline that and put the uh, purchases in this category may only be authorized by the city manager or the assistant city manager with the prior written authorization from the city manager in the city manager's absence. And so everywhere where it reads city manager or their designee, we would want to put in what I just, what I just spoke out, which was again, uh, the assistant city manager with prior written authorization from the city manager in the city manager's absence. So what's getting redlined or stricken is their designee. This person, what, if in the absence of the city manager, the assistant city manager, is, is the one that answers directly to the city council. And we need to be able to keep that direct line of oversight so we can ensure that there is transparency and accountability. So that would be my minor amendment to, the, uh, um, to, this, to this procedure. Thank you, council member. Council member Ibarra? Yes, um, I'm gonna go based uh, on page six. I have some questions, uh, Ms. Barbara. Um, when it says purchases up to 10,000 from the P card, um, that's like a, a credit card per se for department head. Um, yes. Currently, I know council office doesn't have one, uh, so the mayor's office does have one. W um, what was the purpose for the $10,000 limit? Is it for the year, for the month, transaction, and do the cards have that high of an amount? Director Whitehorn. Very few cards. Director Whitehorn, if oh. I might uh, interrupt, can you please put it page six up there for the community, please? Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Good suggestion. Thank you. 
Um, most of the cards do not have a limit that high. Um, if there was a purchase that was close to $10,000, in most cases, the department would have to call purchasing and say, I need to increase my limit for this particular purchase. And they would have to get permission from the purchasing division manager to increase their limit for a one-time transaction to that, to that limit. Most procurement cards have a transaction limit of $2,500. Um, but we're allowing up to $10,000 for P cards um, or check requests. So you wouldn't have to do a purchase order necessarily, which is a little more arduous as far as a process. You could actually just fill out um, a check request form, which is a little less of a challenging process internally. Okay, that was, that was my concern. So cards go that high? Yeah, no, um, most of them do not. I, I okay. don't think there are very many people that even have a monthly limit that high. Okay, I was, gonna, yeah. I was getting worried. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Um, on slide number seven, um, actually, I, I, I would prefer to have the purchases between 50,000 and one and 100,000 um, to come back before mayor and council be, um, before that expense is made. Uh, we had noticed a lot of contracts that were um, approved without our knowledge uh, previously. And um, if council is okay, I, that, I think that would be something that we should have an oversight on because um, due to the, the history that we've had with contracts being signed over $50,000 that we weren't made aware of. So we have contractors in the city with a with a contract approved by the city manager, for example, and we had no idea about. Um, that, would be, that, that would be a recommendation I would make for that second bullet point on, on uh, slide number seven. And that's all that I have on my end. Thank you. Oh, another one, sorry. Uh, slide number nine, um, you said uh, the purchasing policy and uh, the change would be, uh, uh, change to 5% from 1%. And by law, uh, we can do up to 5%. Can we meet halfway and just do 3% instead of the whole 5%? Or do we have to do the whole 5%? Staff is recommending 5% for the local vendor preference. That's fairly standard across the state, um, but that's up to council. Okay, this yeah, this is local vendor preference, right? Mm -hmm. Right, I, I've been harping on that for two years, so uh, 5%, I, I would definitely agree with staff recommendation. Okay, I was just putting a recommendation out there, thank you. Sorry, Ma Madam Mayor, that's all for me. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Madam City Clerk, I have Council Member Ray Nielsen who would like to speak. Uh, I just have a substitute motion. Or I'd like to amend it. I like everything uh, Director Whitehorn in here, um, but I'm not comfortable. I would strike the $100,000 city manager discretion. Just keep it at 50, but everything else. I don't know if anybody else is willing to entertain that, but that's my motion. I'll second. Thank you, Council Member. I have Council Member Sh um, Mayor Pro Tem Charette. Um, my concern with the uh, the city manager in the past, not not a city manager in the past, but the ability for a city manager to sign for something has been that you get a contract from somebody for $49,900 and uh, they go through that and then they come back and say, well, we need an amendment to that contract. I would like to see what we can do about really I know things change, and I don't know how to deal with that. I'm, I don't know if I'm even ar articulating my, my concern properly, but um, I, 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 contracts seem to be, it's easy to come back with an amendment and say, oh, this, this contractor did his $50,000 worth, and now he needs another twenty-five to finish it. I'm that that really I have a problem with that. So I, again, I don't know if I'm articulating the concern properly, but I, is, is there some way of guarding against that? Um, 
I, I don't know that there necessarily is. I think, um, I think one of the challenges of keeping a city manager's threshold or authority at 50,000 is that it's, there are not many contractors that probably stay under that. Right, Barbara, I don't have a problem with the, with the 100,000. Yeah. I think that's probably I don't have a problem with that, but, run into. But, but the same thing could be said about a $100,000 contract, and now all of a sudden they want an amendment or, or they've done the work and, oh, by the way, we need a little bit more to finish the job, so we need another 18000 or 25000 or something. So then it really, it, it starts going, I mean, that would have to come back to us to approve that. It would. And that has come, that has been a problem because we're halfway through the job, they don't have enough, and they say, well, if you can't give me more, then the job's only half done, and... Uh, I'm not going to do any more work unless you pay me. And I think that's, um, I think that can be twofold. I mean, that can be a, a contractor that has either underestimated the amount of work that they would be facing and then has not properly communicated, um, which is, that's, you know, on the contractor, then you, you know, then you have a reason to say, why didn't you communicate with us? You know, you should have told us. Or that can be a two-way communication issue. Did we not properly manage it as staff? Did we not say, hey, this is getting really close to the threshold. If we had a $100,000 contract and it's getting towards 90 or 95 and we're not saying, hey, this is only 75% done. You know, I think, um, I think there really are realistically two potential problems there. It can be a contractor not communicating, or it can be poor project management on our end, or a combination of the two. Um, because I, I think that's the most honest answer yeah, is okay, that you well, could have either. You know, I don't know how to, yeah. uh, like I say, how to articulate to guard against that. Um, I think we can guard but, against our own poor but, project. But management. I hope that we are, and I hope that when we. Uh, send out a, a, a request for quote or bid or proposal that we're doing our job, of course, at our end, and that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And so whoever signs up for that, they sign at the bottom line when we give it to them that they're going to finish the work for that amount, period. We give them a 10%. I, I see our city attorney over there shaking the head saying, you'll never get away with that. Uh, well, I don't, well I don't think in the you private will. sector, you do all the time. In the yeah. private sector, you do. Yeah, I, and, it, and it's very frustrating uh, because I think uh, in some cases, with all due respect to all vendors, I think they know that uh, change orders are easy to come by um, in, in government. I, I, that's just my belief. I could be wrong, but I, I've seen it, um, and, and I've approved a lot of amendments to contracts because, well, we just didn't quite get done or we just didn't get it right the first time. So. Well, I, I don't think, want to belabor this point, but I, I have some concerns with that. I think one of the major issues, having managed these types of contracts over and over again, are twofold. I think the staff has mentioned that sometimes the contractors just go on. They don't communicate to staff. Sometimes staff lets the contractors go and the yarn is pulled a little bit further than it needs to be pulled. But I think the biggest problem is, is that when we issue these types of contracts, we state on their face that it's $50,000. So. If, if we do an under 50 and we look at the scope of services and it should be 40,000, then we should put 39,000. So that we should always be looking at exactly what we're spending. And I think what happens is it just becomes rote to say it's a 50, it's an under 50, so sen suddenly the contract's for $50,000. And what will happen is that departments will use that contract for what it was intended to be, and that was gonna be a $15,000 expenditure, but they still got room on the contract, so they kind of add. So my opinion is it's always not really the dollar amount. It's, again, the management of managing what the costs are and not just letting either doubling up the type of work they're going to do or expanding the scope from its original scope. We've seen a number of, exa of examples of where that happened. How that happened, you know, I can't say, but it's, it's more of a staff management issue. Um, and I think that the purchasing authority should be that for which you need to get something done quickly. Otherwise, if you've budgeted it and the work product is on your work plan, 
then bring it to the council, get it approved, get a bigger contract approved, and get the work done, right? And I think that that is what I've seen, at least as our practice here, is when we've asked for these contracts, it's usually because it's an emergency. We need to hire an investigator or a legal counsel or something like that. <laughs> and we just need to make sure if we do that, we come back immediately with the normal contract. And then we won't have these problems, whether it's 50 or 100. Well, so, and, I, and I, I think you've said that it has a lot to do with our side managing it properly and getting out the right scope of work and not telling the contractor what our limit, limit is. I mean, uh, but I don't want to not tell them um, and have them come in with their legitimate bid and they're they're going to find out that whoa there was it was really budgeted fifty thousand I left fifteen thousand dollars on the table, well sorry, sorry, um, and and that's just the way the way now if you're digging up a street and you don't know that there's a, a power line there that you you know that's a maybe a legitimate change order uh, that he, that they should immediately come back and say hey you told us there were no power lines on this street and we've hit three of them already. And we can't do the job for what we quoted because we need some change orders. Those are legitimate, what we in our uh, industry called customer alterations. Um, and, and so, and I'll, I'll tell you what, um, we, we were able to, we made money on customer alterations. Um, but we didn't do it intentionally. Um, we, we got, a, we got a, 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 a quote to a customer. They bought it. And then they come in and say, oh, well, we'd like this change, and we'd like that change, and we'd like that change. Well, th sorry, those are customer alterations, and you're going to have to pay for those. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, Barbara, is just, just making sure that we're holding uh, people's feet. One last question that wasn't mentioned in here, and I don't know. Is there, did, did someone say something about a, a, a local discount or a local? Local vendor preference. Yes, that was local mentioned. Vendor preference. I know preference. that's something that's been big on your Yes, on sir. your mind, and so, and we are including that here. Yes, or we're increasing it from the one percent that it was in the municipal five. code okay. to five. I'm sorry, I missed that. I missed that. Comment. Of course, Madam Mayor. Oh. Uh, um, Councilmember, I have um, Councilmember Sanchez oh, Roger requesting, that. and then I, I can go no, with you no, after. No worries, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so you. to uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. So to illustrate. Um, a lot of the, the spending authority, because look, the, the city manager can go through the process of, hey, we're gonna put something on the agenda for, for two months from now, we'll, staff will put something together, we'll put it before the council, but there are plenty of cases, and I'm gonna mention two that are good cases and then one that's bad. So we have a case where we have the storm of the century, and we gotta get a contractor right away, there are trees down, power lines are down, there's a mess, we gotta get someone out here right now. They tell, we, we, we do a quick little uh, survey of what it would cost to get some tree people out here, some, some maintenance people. Hey, this is gonna be a $60,000, $80,000, boom, signs away. Then he can come back and say, hey, look, this is just to get them here, get started with the job, but this is gonna be $300,000, $300, $500,000, we need to get it done. A lot of it happens too with litigation. All of a sudden, a complaint comes out, we, we can't be without a lawyer. So the city manager says, hey, we gotta get someone right away on this case. He signs off. I mean, lawyers are getting more and more expensive every day. He gets them on board, he says, but I'm gonna be bringing it before the council. So that's what that is for. That is what that is designed for. Now, in the past, I have witnessed now a, a city manager who knew that the council would not approve a certain thing. And so what they did is they they put it under their $50,000 cap, right? They said, hey, look, there's this consultant, I'm really impressed, they're gonna help me out, but I know the council would never pay $50,000 for this guy, or $100,000 for this guy. So I will go ahead and sneak this in, this little $49,000 contract with this consultant, they're gonna help me out, and then maybe on the consent I can sneak in an amendment to this contract with this consultant who I can keep on board. Um, so those are two scenarios, but we have to allow the city manager in natural disasters, litigation, whatever the case is, to be able to expend that money and then come back to the council and say, hey, this is where I spent it. I'm either gonna need more or the storm wasn't as bad, we didn't have that many trees falls, fall, you know, that many trees fall, $80,000 under my signing authority was enough to get the streets back open. That's, that's what this is for. That is exactly what this is for. And this is, 
we have the mechanism to make sure we don't have that, that type of city manager who's gonna bring in a consultant quietly because they know the council wouldn't approve it. And that's because we have now codified in this ordinance that we're trying to pass tonight um, a reporting. So the city manager would have to report, hey, this is what I'm spending money on. I'm like, uh, this is not right. This is not appropriate. Bring it before the whole council. We'll either deny it or approve it. That's what this is for. That's what that, that is codifying. So I, I, again, make the motion to approve uh, the staff recommendation with my one amendment on the uh, designee, striking that and putting in the assistant city manager. Um, council member, um, if, you, if you are willing to uh, council meet woman. me somewhere. Um, Councilwoman um, Ibarra, yes. I have Councilman David oh, okay. Alexander next. Oh, wait, so I'll add on to his. Okay, I'll wait. Thank you. Councilman Alexander. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate it, and I appreciate your report. And I, and I hear all my council members, uh, and I listen intently to what you're saying about this $50,000. At what point do we have, we don't penalize ourselves or cut our nose to spite our faces on some of these reports and entrust uh, our city manager and staff to do the right thing. Sometimes we, and I, I guess I can be accused of, that, of being uh, in city business so much that we don't know what to do. We need to, we need to trust what we do here. And the best practices when I looked up this is that cities are size, city managers have the amount of at least $125,000. That's their signing authority. I don't know why they brought it down to 100,000, but that's, that's not even the issue here right now. But we have to employ council members to let them move. You can't even buy a car for $50,000. Inflation is at an all time high. I, I personally don't want to be, for them to come before me with buying a car or, or any other menial task to run the city. If we are entrusting them to run the city, let them run it. We can monitor it like Council Member Sanchez says. It's being codified. They have to report it. There's audits. I, Lord knows I believe in audits. There's audits that say shall do because I sat there while Council Director Whitehorn was saying there and it shall have audits. So we have mechanisms in place, just like Council Member Sanchez says. So let's, I implore you to move forward with this least $100,000 where best practices and cities are size. The city manager has the necessary signing authority to do his or her job. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I have Council Woman Ibarra then follow by Council Woman Calvin. Yes, I mean, I. If, based on what Council Member Sanchez was talking about, um, under extreme emergencies, if the city manager does need to up, um, let's, say, let's say, you know, we have a flash flood, for example, like we've had a couple of months ago. Yes, we needed crews out there immediately, and if, and if he had to bring somebody under those extreme emergency moments, is there any way we can add in their verbiage saying, city manager will be authorized to make these purchases under um, emergency situations. That's something. If you look on slide eight, emergency purchases is already codified in the municipal code. Correct, but um, so that would fall under the purchase, the second bullet point on, on slide seven. I'll, I'll be comfortable if if they use that emergency situation for the second bullet, we'll, we'll let him know as long as he t tells us like, you know, we have we had this emergency and we have to hire um, an outside agency to come in and help us immediately for the cleanups. That, I mean, that that's the only way I can approve it. Otherwise, I'm not comfortable with allowing the city manager sole discretion of up to 100,000. I personally, I don't know what cars are, $50,000 right now. I don't spend that much on mine. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Calvin. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, Director Whitehorn. 
Um, I think that, you know, I heard uh, Councilman Alexander speaking about trust, and I think that's primarily our largest issue here, is that when you uh, have been operating within the city of San Bernardino and we've had some, some issues with trust and we've had some issues with uh, uh, folks doing some things that they have, are not supposed to be doing. But I also have a larger problem is that then when those issues uh, become, uh, come to the council's attention that we don't ourselves do our job. And that is uh, making sure that those um, issues are addressed. So it's not just the part of, um, of US staff, it is the part of the council as well to regulate our own selves and make sure that information that is brought to us, that we act upon it, investigate it, and then make it known that this is unacceptable. As far as the raising the, uh, to a $100,000 limit for the city manager, so am I understanding correctly that in the city manager's report, we will now be getting a, a, the, a report of what has been spent? Yes, anything over $40,000 and one, $40,001 and above, any contract over that level, anything spent over that level, would come to you at each council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. All right, I think that's all the comments. Um, I'm now closing the public hearing at 10.18 p.m. for deliberation and action. Do we have a motion? Yes, uh, Council Member um, Reynoso made a motion, I second it. The motion was to... Madam City Clerk, can you read it back? Staff's recommendation, but keeping the signing authority for the city manager at 50,000. And that was seconded by Council Member Ibarra. Uh, Council Member Alexander, did you second my motion? I think we, we were going to keep it at $100,000 and, uh, and just redline designee and put in assistant city manager with, with, with written authority. I, I agree with you 110%, Council Member Sanchez, but there is a substitute motion on the floor, so we have to vote on that. Well, there isn't a motion. That yes, is the is. motion. Yes, there is. It's by Council Member Reynoso, second by uh, so Council Member that's the motion, Ibar. right? Right, there's Can substitute we, motion. My substitute motion would be... No. Okay. My substitute motion would be the uh, the staff recommendation cap out of a hundred thousand. Can we ask the city clerk for the relay of the motion? Yes, there's, there's a lot of back and forth. Can we yes. so clean that up? There is an original motion by Councilmember Sanchez to approve staff's recommendation with the minor amendment to the language in subsection B, um, and this is to change the language where the. Um, the purchase in these categories may only be authorized by the city manager or the assistant city manager with prior written authorization from the city manager in the city manager's absence. That did not receive a second. Oh, so it's not a motion. Oh, okay. That, did, that, that didn't receive a second? Wait, no. That, if it didn't receive a second, then can you go on to the, uh, the next mo and motion? The, the, uh, Council Member Reynoso's motion was to keep staff's recommendation no, no, it wasn't a sub no, because the first original. one didn't get a second. So your motion is going to be the, the, the original motion? Yes. And it was to keep the city manager signing authority at 50000 That was seconded by Council Member Ibarra. So I will make the substitute motion, seconded by Council Member Charette. Don't be confused. It, we're, it's untangled now. <laughs> Are you confused about the motion or the substance? We're on a substitute motion. Council Member um, Sanchez is, appears to be making a substitute motion. You like Which you said you seconded. And I, so I seconded. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, I seconded the substitute motion, I think. Okay. You just did. Okay, so I will call. Can you repeat the second motion? Please. Approve staff's recommendation with the minor amendment to the language in subsection B of section 3.04.04, and it should read as the following. The purchases in the category may only be authorized by the city manager or the assistant city manager with prior written, writ, written authorization from the city manager in their absence. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. 
And then for the record, uh, Mayor and Council, um, there is an administrative correction to the resolution attached to this item. It should read 2023-020. And that was an oversight on our part, city clerk staff. And so I will call the vote if that's what you would like. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? No. Council Member Figueroa is absent for this item. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? No. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Okay, the motion passes for 4 2. Council Members Ibarra and Reynoso voting in opposition. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Next, the public hearing to consider annexation proceedings and elections for City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services, Annexation Number 28 is now open. Do any council members wish to hear the staff report? <laughs> Waving the staff report. Sorry. <laughs> Do any members of the council have any questions or staff wish to make any comments? No. Waving comments. We will now receive comments, protests, and questions from any persons in the audience who wish to speak on this matter. Each person may address the city council for a maximum of three minutes. Please submit your speak speaker slip to the city clerk. Has the city clerk received written protests? No, we have not. Madam city clerk, are there any persons registered to vote with an annexation number 28 of community facilities district number 2019-1? If so, how many registered voters are there? The County of San Bernardino Registrar of Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within Annexation Number 28 of Community Facilities District Number 2019-1. I now declare the public hearing closed. The time being 10:24 p.m. May I have a motion to adopt Resolution Number 2023-01 of the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, calling an election to submit to the qualified electors the question of levying a special tax within the area proposed to be annexed to Community Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services Annexation Number 28. Madam City Clerk, please take a vote. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa is absent for this item. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? No. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Okay, motion passes five to one with Council Member Reynoso voting in opposition. The official ballot has been open and all votes are in favor of the proposition presented on the ballot and the election is now closed. May I have a motion to adopt resolution number 2023-02 of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, declaring election results for Community Facilities District number 2019-1, Maintenance Services, Annexation number 28. Madam City Clerk, please take Second. a vote. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? No. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes 5 to 1 with Council Member Reynoso voting in opposition. I would now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by title only ordinance number MC1608 of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, amending ordinance number MC1522 and levying tax special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 2022 to 2023 to pay the annual cost of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks and trail maintenance, a reserve fund for capital replacement and administrative expenses with respect to the city of San Bernardino, community facilities district number 2019-1, maintenance services. Madam, Madam City Clerk, please Second. take a vote. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Sherat? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? No. Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Aye. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Motion passes five to one with Council Member Reynoso voting opposition. Thank you. Next, the public hearing on annexation number 29 to Community Facilities District 2019-1. The public hearing to consider an annexation proceedings and elections for City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District number 2019-1 maintenance services annexation number 29 is now open. Do any council members wish to hear the staff report? Council Mayor. Mayor. Yes. That item is being continued by staff. Oh, thank you. I don't have to go through all that reading. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next public hearing on annexation number 30 to community facilities, a district 2019-1. The public hearing to consider annexation proceedings and elections for City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District number 2019-1, maintenance services annexation number 30 is now open. Do any council members wish to hear the staff report? I hear none, thank you. Do any members of the council have any questions of staff or wish to make any comments? I hear none. We will now receive comments, protests, and questions from any persons in the audience who wish to speak on this matter. Each person may address the city council for a maximum of three minutes. Please submit your speaker slip to the city clerk. I have received zero written protests on this item. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam City Clerk, are there any persons registered to vote with an annexation number 30 of Community Facilities District number 2019-1? If so, how many registered voters are there? The County of San Bernardino Registrar of Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within annexation number 30 of Community Facilities District number 2019-1. Thank you. I now declare the public hearing closed, the time being 10.29 p.m. May I have a motion to adopt resolution number 2023-06 of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, calling an election to submit to the qualified electors the question of levying a special tax within the area proposed to be annexed to Community Facilities District number 2019-1, maintenance services, annexation number 30. Second. Madam City Clerk, please take the vote. Council Member Sanchez? Yes. Council Member Ibarra? Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Council Member Shura? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. May I have a motion to adopt Just resolution number 2023-6? Mayor Chen, Just, I need to read this section. The official ballot has been open and all votes are in favor of the proposition presented on the ballot and the election is now closed. Thank you. May I have a motion to adopt resolution number 2023-7? 07 of the Mayor City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, declaring election results for Community Facilities Number Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services Annexation, annexation Number 30. I would now ask for a motion to have further reading and, and introduced by Title Only Ordinance Number MC6. Mayor, Mayor Tran, we need to take a vote on the oh. resolution. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I was trying to speed through that. I would now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by title only ordinance number MC1610 of the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino. California amending ordinance number MC1522 and levying special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 2022 to 2023 to pay the annual costs of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water, quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks and trail maintenance, a reserve fund for the capital replacement and administrative expenses with respect to the city of San Bernardino, community facilities district number 2019-1, Maintenance services. Madam, Madam City Clerk. I'll second. Please take the vote. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is the public hearing on annexation number 32 to Community Facilities District 2019 1. 
the public hearing to consider annexation proceedings and elections for City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District Number 2019-1 Maintenance Services Annexation Number 32 is now open. Do any council members wish to hear the staff report? Hear none. Do any council members um, or members members of the council have any questions of staff or wish to make any comments? I hear none. We will now receive comments, protests, questions from any persons in the audience who wish to speak on this matter. Each person may address the city council for a maximum of three minutes. Please submit your speaker to the speaker slip to the city clerk. We do have one speaker on this. Do we do. Okay. I have it. I do have it. Um, we do have a public speaker, Dolores Armstead. This is just a, an observation um, for the city. This, this item is basically for a, another fast food restaurant uh, off of city's off ramp. This is in the, let's see. This was at the intersection of Palm and Industrial. And my comment and observation is that is a main entryway to the city of San Bernardino, another main entryway to the city of San Bernardino, another fast food restaurant. We either get fast food restaurants or the last thing we had a fast food restaurant and a car wash. Can we get something nice like a, re a real restaurant? A real restaurant, not a fast food. We have the college there. We have all those homes being built, and we have the Little League, and I'm sure those people would like to have something nice they can go to besides another fast food restaurant. My comment, thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, are there any persons registered to vote within annexation number 32 of Community Facilities District number 2019-1? If so, how many registered voters are there? Mayor, for the record, I did not receive any written protests on this item. And then the County of San Bernardino Registrar of Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within annexation number 32 of Com Community Facilities District number 2018-1. Thank you. I now declare the public hearing closed. The time being 10.34 p.m. May I have a motion to adopt resolu resolution number 2023-08 of the Mayor City and City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, calling an election to submit to the qualified electors the question of levying a special tax within the area proposed to be annexed to Community Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services Annexation Number 32. Move approval. Second. Councilmember Sanchez. Yes. Councilmember Ibarra. Yes. Councilmember Figueroa. Yes. Councilmember Shirak. No. Councilmember Reynoso. No. Councilmember Calvin? No. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay, motion passes five to two with Councilmembers um, Reynoso and Calvin voting in opposition. Thank you. The official ballot has been open and all votes are in favor of the proposition presented on the ballot and the election is now closed. Thank you. May I have a motion to adopt resolu resolution number 2023-09 of the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, declaring election results for Community Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services, Annexation Number 32. I'll second. Madam City Clerk, please take the vote. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? No. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes 6 to 1 with Council Member Reynoso voting in opposition. Thank you. I would now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by title only Ordinance Number MC 1611 of the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino, California, amending Ordinance Number MC 1522 and levying special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 2022 to 2023 
to pay the annual cost of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks and trail maintenance, a reserve fund for capital replacement, and administrative expenses with respect to the City of San Bernardino, Community Facilities District Number 2019-1, Maintenance Services. Second. Madam City Clerk, please take the vote. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? No. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes 6 to 1 with Councilmember Reynoso voting in opposition. Thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar. Items 11 through 32. Council members um, and staff, any questions or any polls? I have a uh, councilwoman. Uh, 28 for questions. I'd like to register my vote, city clerk, on number 24 and 25 is a no. Any others? So I, I have a council, a council member Reynoso 24 and 25. And oh, registering, okay. Thank you for that clarification. Just one poll then from Councilwoman um, Calvin for number 28. Is that correct? I believe we pulled just a uh, number 20. For, just, for a question? Council member Calvin, you're, you're, it's just a question, right? You're not pulling for a separate vote? Oh, okay. Yeah, can we pull 20? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, she is pulling it. Um, thank you. May I have the motion to pass the remainder of the consent calendar Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Councilwoman Nibar, did you have a poll? It's 20. Well, I, I had questions on number 20. Ms. Susie, I think, it, um, made the report. A second on Councilmember Charette. So there's two polls, right, Madam City Clerk? 20 and 28. I just right. want to make sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, 20 is a poll, right? It's just questions. So it's part of the balance. Um, yeah. Ms. City Attorney. Um, if you have the multiple third item. questions, then I would just ask that you pull the item. The okay, let's move for the remainder of the balance. There's a motion and second for the remainder of the balance, correct? Yes. Madam City Clerk, okay. take the vote. Council Member Sanchez. This is on the balance? Yes. Which pulls again? 20 and, 20 and, and 28. 28. And Reynoso registering no on 24 and 25. 28. Uh, okay, yes. Council Member Ibarra. Yes. Council Member Figueroa? Yes. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Calvin? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Aye. Okay, the motion to approve consent is unanimous. And for the record, Council Member Reynoso is registering a no vote for item 24 and 25. Thank you. So there is a poll for item number 20. 20, Councilwoman Ibarra? Yes, uh, Ms. Susie, on the report, uh, just to clarify to the audience, um, there were some comments made earlier. Um, you have a chart, I don't know what page it is based on, on the computer here, but it's where you have the breakdown of the case firm, current not to exceed amount, and the proposed not to exceed amounts. Okay, um, the last two items, under Atkinson, Andelson, Loya, Rudd and Romo, and Stream, Kim, Hicks. Those are both uh, closed uh, cases. Uh, is the current amount paying out, paying out to them 200 and 100,000, or are we, uh, we still owe them the uh, proposed? And good evening, Susie Soren, Director of Human Resources. Um, no, it's whatever invoices are still left to be paid um, is what the additional up to 250 would cover. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be the full 250, but it's just allowing in the event that there's invoices that come in that were not previously provided. Okay, and then I see that some of the attachments, um, the amendment done on the stream, Kim, Hicks, and Rage, um, the maximum approved by council back in April of last year was 150,000, not the 250,000 on that one. So just clarification on that. And if and I, I don't think I can vote on that. I just wanted to clarify for everybody. 
I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Just that, because the last amendment that I saw in the packet was for 150,000 oh, amount sorry. April of last year. Barra, I hate to interrupt, but um, the rules under the FPPC are that if you have a conflict and are not going to vote on a matter, when it's on the consent calendar and it's pulled, then you have to leave the dais. Oh, I can't recuse myself? Well, you, you can't have it both ways, so you either recuse yourself entirely um, or you stay. Okay. Now, well, I just wanted clarification because the numbers threw me off, and I'm pretty sure that's what threw off the speaker earlier. Okay. I, I totally understand your desire to clarify to that community. I just don't want you to get in, be in any unfortunate position with respect to a conflict of interest. She, she doesn't have a conflict of interest, though, does she? Well, um, to the extent that this has to do with the payment of fees for her uh, legal matter, yes, she would. But the, the, the case is closed. But the payment of the fees still remain an issue. The first item is not my item, though. I understand. So can we vote on those separately? You can. You can make a motion on item 21 and 2, and you can participate. And I would advise you not to say anything further on number 3. Okay. So, Madam City Clerk, can you assist? You would have to make a formal motion to separate the items, and that would have to be seconded in, a, under, in order for us to consider them each item individually. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion that for item 20, um, that we take a separate vote for items 1 and 2, and then for item 3, I will recuse myself. Is there a second for that motion? Council Member Sanchez? Uh, this is to separate, right? Yes. No. Council Member mm. Ibarra? Yes. Madam City Clerk, before you proceed, we have some council members who need some clarification, please, before we continue. So my understanding is I can't, I can't, I've given my advice for the individual, so the individual has to make their own decision. Um, the consequences are for that individual. So my understanding is that in previous times, she has decided to um, abstain from participating in decisions regarding payments to this particular law firm. And my continued advice is that she should abstain from participating in making decisions with respect to number three. Do you see that, 20? No, you don't have to vote on it. I think what she was saying is that because she can't participate in the vote on number three, I read it to be that she was going to make a motion on numbers one and two. That's the way I saw it. So the vote right now is for the council to vote on item number 20, one and two. Correct. Moving for approval. approval on 20, one and two. Just, just to separate. Why are we making it so difficult? Could we have a motion to approve 20, one and two? I would like to... Make a motion to approve 20 as is. Second. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Sanchez. And this is just for audience and myself and my colleagues. This is to approve 20 as is. Yes. My understanding is you have to recuse yourself from this item. Council Member Figueroa. Yes. Council Member Charette? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Council Member Calvin? I would love to vote right now, but I'm just very confused as to then if Council Member Ibarra is supposed to be still sitting on the dais as we get ready to take this, as we're voting on it. The recommendation from the city attorney was that she needed to leave the, the room. Okay. Yes. Aye. Thank you. The item passes unanimously. So, with the next poll, council members? The next poll is number 28. I, Councilwoman Kim Calvin. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, um, Director Gutfield. Let me get my bearings back real quick. Um, so I just I had a few questions, and I would, I would like for you just maybe to like unpack it a little bit for us, right? It has a big price tag attached, and that way then we can all understand exactly what this is and whether or not this is, um, if we have also um, purchased any of these items within this package right here already, so if the council has already invested prior to. So um, first and foremost, good evening, or almost morning, I guess. <laughs> um, what we're proposing here, or the, what the recommendation is to go with the next level consultant services, um, the price is higher, um, but it's something that was already approved in our CIP budget for 23-24 and 24-25 as far as the price tag. What we're getting when we compare the two uh, consulting firms is you have RJM, who was the consulting firm that provided us with the update of our master plan last time done in 2008. When the panel looked at both of these candidates, we saw one big thing that popped out. One from RJM seemed to be a rinse and repeat. There was not new suggestions. There was not new efforts in what was going to take our city to the next level as to where the next level actually provided us with a few things that I'm gonna point them out. Number one is they're not looking to what we're gonna look like in 2032. They're being realistic and looking what we're gonna look like in the next five years with what our current funding status is and what our current grant status is. Number two, they're looking at a perspective of an entire wholehearted city, not just at our parks. They're looking at a business plan. They're looking at our staffing plan, and they're looking at how we can effectively actually do a community needs assessment survey that's going to hit every single community and see what the needs are in priority order. Number three, they're looking at our CIP planning. They see what we're already doing, and they have a lot of technology to back them up. This is one of the um, most acclaimed uh, leaders in the master planning world as far as parks and recreation goes. Um, Nile, Nile is the owner of the company. He has reached out to me. I've worked with both RJM and Next Level on multiple projects in other agencies that I've uh, seen, and I can tell you the product is gold standard. Um, we also ha have the opportunity to be um, in consultant services with Next Level to see what it is that this city will need to do to take our city parks and our recreation staff to that level of gold standard for national parks and recreation, which is when we spoke and when I got hired here for the city, I told you was my number one goal was to be able to take us to that level. Thank you for that, um, Director um, Gutfield. Uh, so let me, let me just ask this question. I saw here, it speaks about having community input but uh, how, how often will we be getting a report back? You, you know, this is a lot of this is a lot of money, and what I don't want to see happen is that we're just not we're not being kept abreast as to where we are and how you all are um, the assessment of each park is going mm -hmm. uh, within the entire city because we know that there are some parks in our city that have just been abandoned. So I want to know, you know, of the assessment. Um, measures like how are we going to do that and are you going to be this company are they going to be coming before the council to report out so that the community can also understand absolutely so my standard with master planning is once a week i have an updated report from the consultant that means for you i will be able to have it as often as once a week if you want it reported monthly at your council meetings i can do that as well but i think the best thing for us to do is probably do a quarterly dashboard and let you know where we are in the process i also think anytime that we do a community meeting and we find any new trends and practices and best practices i apologize i've lost my voice um, that we're able to report those to the council and mayor as well okay so this is uh, this company that we're going to be hiring this consultant, they're just going to be assisting then the Department of Park and Recreation, right? I mean, are you guys are going to be working, they're going to be working hand in hand with you all, mm -hmm. right? To make sure that um, all of our parks are assessed, right? And that we know exactly what, what they need mm -hmm. and that um, we will all know when these, the works are going to be done. So are they also responsible for the work or are they, they're just responsible for the master plan? Exactly. So the master plan is gonna cost us a million dollars 
in order to have a master plan? I want you to think of it as a master plan and a business plan. So that is one of the things, if you look at our current service levels and our programming, it's very minimal because there has been a major need for a community needs assessment. And so once we have that in that. play, we're able to put not only our community centers into play, but we're able to put the right amount of staff for the right programming within each ward and each community. The difference is when you're looking at next level, they're not an architectural firm. RJM is, and so there's different motives when the proposals mm. come through. And I believe that next level is the right choice, and that is our staff recommendation, simply on just that basis. The second part is looking at what RJM provided in 2008 was ineffective in implementation. It was not realistic with what the current needs of the city were. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Motion to approve. One question, how long is it gonna take for this master plan to get done? My goal is 18 months. How's it work in conjunction with our general plan? It works beautifully the CIP. and complement the CIP plan, the general plan. Are and you speaking to play, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish. And then your playbook as well. <laughs> right. That was my, yeah, the playbook. That the, the general plan, the specific plan, have you talked to PlaceWorks? Yes, I've talked to PlaceWorks and I've actually, I shouldn't say I, I have received information from both of the proposals and that was in their proposal to talk about how this would complement all of the current plans and strategic items in place by the city. So um, the master plan, completion in 18 months, mm -hmm. in the meantime, what will we be, are we on hold then with the development that we already have listed, CIP, our parks, are we on hold? We're gonna be just no, continuing. current CIP, CIP plan will be moving forward as approved with funds approved. Thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk. Yes. The votes are open on the digital vote. So you, so you are gonna bring back those quarterly dashboards to us, correct? As often as you like them, sir. Uh, no, no, is that? Yes. The yes, thank you. <laughs> I, need, I need affirmative. Can we vote already? Madam City Clerk is not popping up on their end. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now, items to be considered for future meetings. Uh, recognized partnership with uh, Casa Ramona. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes, uh, so as you know, the, uh, uh, the old Casa Ramona campus, that's a pillar and an anchor on the west side, uh, fell into uh, disrepair. Uh, Esther Estrada, almost on her own, uh, was able to get a hold of a $5 million grant from the Department of Toxic Control. And they're going to start cleaning up the site, and they're gonna set aside seed money uh, to build uh, affordable senior housing with a community center uh, on the campus. And I think it's, uh, it's pr it would be prudent of the city to show support um, for, uh, for the community center and for the project, uh, and then enter into a formal relationship so that we can use that facility as a place where we can run uh, city programs out of. And of course, Casa Ramona would provide the facility. We would help um, expedite uh, the process to get this project off the ground. And so it's, it benefits them, it benefits us, it benefits the West Side. And I, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great opportunity to partner. Oh, uh, motion. Uh, uh, council members, we have uh, Councilwoman Calvin who would like to make some comments. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Mayor. I appreciate this, um, Council Member uh, Sanchez. And I was just wondering if we could establish that uh, we have another uh, community center that is very, very old as well on the West Side home of the neighborly service, and, and they are uh, struggling, and their building is decaying and falling apart, and if they could be co included in this um, professional service agreement as well, that we would try to preserve both of those agencies. 
Uh, yes, um, and again, uh, the the unique opportunity with Casa Ramona is that they're going to be paying for the uh, um, they're going to be paying for the community center. Um, we're we're basically going to help help them through the process, but uh, there's no financial commitments. But there is nothing wrong with um, with formalizing a relationship and an understanding of the value that those both those facilities provide uh, to the west side. So I mean, I'm amenable to adding. Um, uh, the facility at uh, its um, home and neighborly service. So yeah, we can throw that in there. I just I just want to I want to tamper expectations, and uh, it doesn't mean that because of the formal relationship we're gonna we're gonna set aside a couple million dollars to rebuild the the uh, home and neighborly service. Uh, what Casa Ramon is doing is is almost completely independent of us financially. Uh, they were able to through their sheer hard work attain a five million dollar grant. Uh, which is incredible. Um, so I want I want to make that clear, and I want to tamper expectations. But there's nothing wrong with formalizing a relationship with uh, home and neighborly service. So could we, do, could we make that amendment? Would you be fine with that friendly amendment? Most definitely. Yes. Yes. Of course. Yes. Yes. So that would that, that's my that's my all uh, amended motion. Thank you, Council Member. Madam City Clerk. The, the votes are open. Are they populating on your end? Okay, we'll take a voice vote for the remaining items. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Sherratt? Yes. Councilmember Reynoso? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. I want to make note that uh, Councilmember Figueroa must be the smartest among all of us because he was able to somehow vote electronically. The rest of us couldn't, but he was able to. Thank you. The next item is initiate request for proposal seeking a consultant to prepare a feasibility study for installing bike lanes and crosswalk, impro crosswalk improvements in downtown. Council Member Reynoso, can you Move to approve. We, for, I mean, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that, but Council Member Sanchez, I think you remember, we approved this at the last meeting as an in-house study. I'd actually requested that we initiate a study on the come February 1st. I'm um, expecting to see it here to assess all park lights with the goal of adding lights to all of our parks. So yes, we can, I'm afraid to approve this though because we, we accept, accepted this in the beginning of December as an in-house study. We're specifically against consultants and I'm still against that. So uh, Madam City Attorney, what, what do we do about like, it's on the record now, you know? It's worded as consultant. Do we have to like double approve it again as an in-house study? It got duplicated. It's not supposed to be here. It's not supposed to be here. We approved this Ms. in December. Ms. City Manager, can you clarify? Council Member Reynoso, I don't believe this is a duplicate item. I know that we brought forward a different item on December 7th, and we were, we were, yes, there were multiple ones for downtown, and we were working off a list that we had to reprioritize when you brought forward the, um, Item, no, 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 the item for uh, declaring homelessness an emergency. And then that reprioritized the items and then you added the, the uh, lighting at uh, city parks, but this one was already in the queue. Uh, second. Hey, uh, I like the idea. I recently read a book on, uh, well, yeah, forget it, I, that's too much right now. Um, can we can we just do can we do the feasibility study in house? Can we have staff take a look at it and say, can we, are you fine with that? Okay, that's my motion or that's my second. Councilmember Sanchez. Yes. Councilmember Ibarra. Oh, that's the name. Councilmember Figueroa. Yes. Councilmember Charette. Yes. Councilmember Reno. Yes. Councilmember Calvin. Yes. Councilmember Alexander. Aye. Okay. Motion passes with six votes in favor. Councilmember Ibarra is abstaining. Thank you. Next, direct staff to work with the Mayor and City Council to evaluate and determine the appropriate staffing levels in the office of the Mayor and City Council office. Councilmember Alexander, can you please speak on your request? Yes, uh, do uh, direct staff to do exactly what you just said. Second. <laughs> is that your motion? Yes. It is. Second. Madam City Clerk. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Councilmember Charette? Yes. 
Council Member Reynoso. Yes. Council Member Kelvin. Yes. Council Member Alexander. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I would like to adjourn this meeting in memory of the Riverside County Sheriff Deputies Darnell Calhoun and Isaiah Cardero. Can we please take a moment of silence? Okay, the next uh, joint regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council and the Mayor and City Council acting as a successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency will be held on February 1st, 2023 at the Feltime Central Library located at 555 West 6th Street, San Bernardino, California 92401. Closed session will begin at 5.30 and open session will begin at 7 p.m. Meetings adjourned. Mayor, I would like to just remind you that that's one down and four years to go. Well Thank done. You. Well done, Mayor I Tran. did it. Well done. You did well. It's 11. <laughs>